Good evening, folks. Hi, how are you? Hi, good. Evening. good. Hello, everyone. Nice to see everyone. I see some familiar faces here. Howdy. Howdy. Started about one minute. There's still people coming in steadily. Okay, folks, welcome to our wonderful evening. We've been building up to this for the last several weeks. Myself and Dr. Keating from the Hanover Area School District and Old Ford School District, we have partnered to host this uh, terrific evening. Um, we have nearly 300 folks set to partake in this this evening. Um, 30 different organizations spanning from Philadelphia all the way up to Delaware Valley. As I said, Hanover Area School District, Scranton School District, and all across the IU 18 and 19 region. So I'm very proud to be the co-host here this evening. I'm very excited to have Dr. Kilpatrick here. And um, I'd like to introduce Sandy Lamana. Sandy? Um, good evening, everyone. Um, as Nate said, my name is Sandy Lamana, and I would also like to welcome all of you this evening. And I am here representing the Scranton Education Improvement Organization in Stories Literacy Center. But before I uh, tell you, I'd like to tell you just briefly a little bit about what we do. But before I do that, I really want to thank um, Superintendent um, Nate Barrett and Dr. Keating for tonight. Because as everybody knows, I've tried to retire twice and there will come a day when I do retire. And I know that I'm leaving the field in very capable hands. Um, I just want to say you two are the most innovative, compassionate, capable educators with whom I've had the pleasure of working. I just want to say that you have an uncanny ability to stay on top of the relevant educational research, but more importantly, I'm always so in awe of how you're able to take that and develop. I have to set them up through my Bluetooth innovative programs. So I want to thank you for that. A couple of other people. Um, I want to thank Meg Duffy and El Eliza Vagney, um, who are truly um, collaborators and educators extraordinaire, oftentimes partners in crime. Um, and I want to thank um, Ro Hume from the Scranton School District, because truly two years ago, when Ro had the pleasure of meeting Dr. Kilpatrick at one of our um, seminars, she, the seed was kind of planted for bringing Dr. Kilpatrick back to really talk to those people who were, you know, our, our school administrators, our school board members, you know, many of the decision makers in our area. So I want to thank them for that. And as far as the Scranton Education Improvement Organization goes, um, we are a very small nonprofit. Um, it evolved about eight years ago in response to the widely publicized information about the uh, literacy crisis in the United States. Um, it's comprised of a cross section of people from the business, the medical and the legal, the educational community. And our goal was, um, our overall goal is to really mobilize the entire community around this issue because it, schools can't do it alone. It has to be a collaborative effort by all stakeholders in the community. And the other thing we did is we wanted to make sure that we were really taking the compelling evidence really from a convergence of scientific research and share that with everybody who needed to have that information and also help them understand that. Um, more recently, we're doing tutoring. We're using the LIPS program from Linda Mood Bell. Um, next week, we're incorporating core knowledge. And we just do a variety of things, too numerous to really um, share with you tonight, but I will, put it, I will put our contact information in the chat. And I wanna thank Nate for inviting us down to Luzerne County so we could start partnering with the same, you know, individuals, you know, our count, their, uh, the Lackawanna County um, group, their counterparts in Luzerne County, if possible, the medical community, the educational and everybody like that. So Nate, I thank you for that. And um, one last thing, I just want to end. I, I was reading this quote yesterday, and of all places, in a yoga teacher instruction book, um, Meg Duff and I and Eliza, we really 
Oh my gosh, we really um, took a deep dive this year into the research on childhood trauma. And as part of that, we were really studying yoga and mindfulness and meditation as recommended by some of the leading trauma scholars in the world. And I, um, you know, as those of you who know me know, I'm not just doing a few downward facing dogs and a few poses. I have to go right into the research and start studying all this stuff as does Meg and Eliza. But I wanna share this quote because I thought it was so relevant, relevant to what we're doing tonight. And here it is, teaching with integrity involves being clear about the sources of our instruction in our education. When we draw from such sources, it is helpful to have thought through what we think about what is being put forth. So our goal tonight is that you really think thoughtfully and carefully about what Dr. Kilpatrick has to present, and that hopefully you'll take that information back to your respective school districts and other institutions, and you know, really think about creating literacy plans that are really aligned to the science of reading and, and, and your syllabi in your respective um, universities. So um, without any further ado, I'll turn this over to Erin. Hi folks, on uh, behalf of the Old Forge School District, it is my honor to introduce tonight's featured speaker. David A. Kilpatrick, PhD, is a professor for the State University of New York College at Cortland. He is a New York State Certified School Psychologist with 28 years experience in schools. He has been teaching courses in learning disabilities and is educational psych and educational psychology since 1994. David is a reading researcher and the author of two books on reading, Essentials of Assessing, Preventing, and Overcoming Reading Disabilities, Difficulties, and Equipped for Reading Success. He is also the co-editor of a third, Reading Development and Difficulties, Bridging the Gap Between Research and Practice. In contemporary publications on reading acquisition, reading difficulties and literacy, Dr. Kilpatrick's works are seminal. You cannot pick up a book on literacy without having his work cited throughout the text. As our own Sandy Lamana will tell all of us, Dave is the Mick Jagger of the literacy world. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. David Kilpatrick. Oh, uh, thanks. Um, I appreciate that. I need to call up the right, oh, here we go. Oh, hold on a minute. Let me just do that again. Uh, sometimes things come up the right way and sometimes they don't. So here we go. Let's try that. Okay, now I think we're looking at just one. Um, by the way, I do want to mention it from the introduction, um, I've worked 26 years as a, a college instructor and uh, 28 years as a school psychologist. Those two overlap. I'm not 78. I mean, I feel 78 sometimes, but I'm not. Um, so I've, I've spent a lot of time with one foot in each environment. Um, and really a lot of what I'm talking about tonight is, is a result of um, the kind of line of inquiry that you might have as someone who actually worked in schools for so long and, and then try to interface that with the research. Um, this looks like a pretty, uh, now hopefully some of you have access to, uh, there's a PDF. So if you don't get every single note down here, um, hopefully you, you would be able to, uh, you know, still have this information. But I have a pretty ambitious set of uh, objectives, as you'll see. And I'm pretty sure we'll get through them. But all of them are going to be, um, uh, actually, um, uh, Lisa, I, I keep getting these things at the top of the screen about admitting people. Are you able to get that too or no? Maybe I'll just have to do it as we go along. Yes, I am. I am admitting them as we go along. Oh, good, good. Okay. I wasn't, I wasn't sure because when you shifted it over to me, I didn't know if that was something you still had. Okay, thank no, you. Can, thank you. All right. So first of all, to talk about the importance of reading in life, and I think I don't need to say too much about that. As we know, it is very important. Um, and the second is to understand the nature of word level reading. 
That's really going to be the focus tonight. How do we read the words off the page, at which point our language comprehension uh, that is based on vocabulary, background knowledge, inferencing, et cetera, kicks in. Um, but, but how do we get the words off the page? Because as you know, if you work in schools, you know children who struggle in reading the words. If you read it to them, they would understand it very well. So that's something we want to avoid. If, if we want children to be able to understand what they read at the same level that they understand if something that was read to them. And we're going to talk about a gap between research and practice. I will mention this. Back in 2009, the American Federation for Teachers had something that was just updated. Uh, and it was called Teaching Reading is Rocket Science. And back then, they referred to a chasm between research and practice. So this isn't some crazy, crazy idea of mine. And in 2008, the Journal of Learning Disabilities, uh, it's always number one or two in terms of top journal in the area of special education. And when I say top journal, just so you know, everybody says we're number one, right? No, they, they rank journals based on if other journals cite them. Uh, so they're very well respected. And they did a whole article, uh, series of articles and one entire issue on how come we have all this great research and it's not actually being put into practice. So we'll come back to that, but I think it's, it's important to recognize we wanna narrow that gap and that's gonna help a lot of children. And what are the key skills for proficient word reading? What do you actually have to be able to do? Every kind of, uh, every kind of endeavor we have in life are based on some component skills. And what are those component skills that we need? If, you're, if you play basketball, there's some component skills. You gotta write, dribble, shoot, pass, play defense, et cetera. Same thing with reading. Why do some children struggle? And they're not always the ones you easily would predict. You have some kids that we know are very bright and they struggle with word reading. Why is that? And then why is it that a lot of the ways we approach reading now and have been for the last few decades, why is it not helping those kids in the bottom end? Why are, why are there so many of them struggling? Um, and then very briefly, um, I'm gonna talk at the end about where we need to head with all this, because there are instructional approaches that produce much better results than other instructional approaches. And that's what we wanna focus ourselves on, focus our attention on. Uh, whoops, um, we probably won't get into screening. I'm not really sure that was something I know that was a thought, but we probably won't get into that uh, tonight. All right, so here's my real objective. I, I listed the, the ones <laughs> as you saw, but here's my real objective. My real objective is that, to try to whet your appetite. I wanna do for you what a guy named Phil McGinnis did for me back in the summer of 97. I was already a practicing school psychologist full-time. I was already an adjunct teaching courses and learning disabilities and educational psychology. And he's the one that let me know there was this gigantic area of reading research outside my field, my school psychology field. And, and it was, um, I, I had access to the research literature and have because I was a college instructor. And, and I wanted I wanna sort of provide the impetus for you to, to really pursue all this as well. That's the real motivation. All right, um, a couple of related resources. I'm going to, these are in the printouts that you have received. Um, I'm not covering reading comprehension tonight. Here are two outstanding books that will help with that. Anybody working K-12 with students would benefit from these books. And they're thin, they are easy reads, they're written for teachers, written for people working in school, school psychologists, uh, speech pathologists, et cetera. And they're written by researchers themselves who are digesting a whole, whole career's worth of great stuff. Um, and then for we have uh, many, many children in our country who English is not their first language. Here are two excellent. I especially recommend the second one. Once again, anybody K-12, pre-K to 12 that works with children where English isn't their first language should read, read that. All right. And some listening resources. If you haven't listened to Emily Hanford's podcasts. Those are really great to listen to. Um, here are some other sources. The IES, that's Institutional for Educational Sciences Practice Guides. They have about five or so on reading. They've also got them on math. They've got them on writing. They've got them on classroom management. It's really good. And what they do is they, the federal government has people distill uh, the key features that are most useful for teachers to know about. So um, I'm going to focus on two of the five reading ones and it's these two here, I, I not focus on them, but the, the similar content. And then the Reading League, I put a little plug for that. I was one of the founding members uh, of that. And they have all kinds of uh, resources, free online, professional development. They have a journal. Uh, and then the International Dyslexia Association has had so many great resources. Okay, so you have those. Those are, those are they'll keep you, you know, there's a lot to pursue uh, there just with that. 
All right, let me talk about the field of the research and reading. It's huge. People don't realize that. I didn't realize that. I was a practicing school psychologist for nine years before I knew this existed, and yet it's gigantic. And by the way, I did an updated estimate, um, and it's really more than close to a thousand scientifically oriented research reports appear in English every year. Now, not all of them are on English, uh, probably about 60% are English, but English is the international language of science. So if you're doing a research in Germany or Spain or uh, anywhere, you want to get it in an English journal. Uh, they have their own journals, their own language journals, but English is where you want it to be. But we learn so much from uh, research on those other languages, by the way. We get very myopic for English and for the United States, and, and there's so much more that we can learn. This research flies under the radars of a lot of fields that overlap in, uh, in schools, including my field, school psychology. Um, there have been numerous, um, there have been numerous research reports on this. The research is so huge that nobody can stay on top of all of it. With a thousand uh, research reports and reviews every year, nobody can stay on top of it. So we have these niche areas. And interestingly, one niche area is studying what impact is the reading research having on the educational field? And um, they've studied, you see the different subfields here. Um, and most folks in these areas don't really have much of an awareness of, of that, okay? Now, the next several slides are not in your handout. I'm, I'm only, it's only gonna take me two minutes to get through these next few slides. I wanna leave you with an impression. That's why I'm doing these next few slides of how vast this research is and how much there is to sift through. So here you have six journals exclusively devoted to scientific research reports and reviews. When I say a review, that's when you sit down and look at a bunch of reports and, and look for trends and make sense of it all. Um, and they have between four and six issues per year and maybe four to six articles per issue. So already you're talking about a couple, you know, a few hundred research articles with these. But then you have some other journals also devoted to reading and literacy that mostly have scientific articles, but they have some uh, that are more position papers or, or you know, some, some qualitative things, et cetera. Um, so now you're up to 10 journals exclusively devoted to reading. But you can't just rely on those. Some of the most important research studies in reading in the field haven't been in those journals. There are a lot of scientific journals that publish on reading every single issue, but they publish on a lot of other topics. And uh, that would include um, these here. All right, so these you got to go sifting through. Every issue they have on that, say the Journal of Educational Psychology, one, two, three, four of their 15, they have about 15 articles, it's a big journal, uh, are going to be on reading. And, and then there are others that don't publish on reading every issue, but they publish on reading multiple times throughout the year. And you have to pay attention to those because there have been many important research findings in those. And that would be these right here. So uh, I think by now you realize it's a, it's a pretty vast field uh, and, and there's a lot to sift through. Um, and look at all the different languages that contribute to this. I'm a member of the Society for Scientific Study of Reading, and there's only about 500 of us or so in that group from all around the world. And we have representatives from all these language systems and all these different countries. Once again, we get a little bit myopic for the United States and a little bit myopic for English, but there's so much to learn uh, by studying other languages. There's so much we've learned about English by studying reading in other languages. Um, and, and, and look at all the fields that contribute. You cannot go to a university in the United States or the UK or anywhere else and walk up and say, hey, uh, where's the reading research department? It does not exist. It doesn't exist. What we have instead is you have a small number of people across all these fields, maybe one half of a percent or 1%, maybe 2% of people in each of these fields study reading. And all of these are represented in the Society for Scientific Study of Reading. For example, two of our last five presidents of the organization have been from speech pathology departments at universities. So this is truly interdisciplinary. Harvard University has people contributing from their School of Arts and Sciences, both the psychology department and the linguistics department. They have people contributing from their education department and their medical school, okay? So this is really huge. And you've probably heard of Harvard, right? So this, we're not talking about obscure universities, obscure type of things, but it just uh, it's not making the front page of the paper, unfortunately. So there is this gap, as I mentioned, and the gap is because we have this silo problem. There are so many different things. In 1840, if you got a bachelor's degree, you would have been exposed to everything that was known at the time in science, medicine, history, and you probably would have learned Latin and Greek as well. It's not like that anymore. 
we'd have this huge uh, explosion of information over the last 160, 170 years. And uh, as a result, people work in separate silos, even within a simple one is the medical field, right? The average ophthalmologist is not reading cardiology journals, and, and, but the psychology has gotten huge and the reading research has gotten huge. And, and that makes it a bit of a problem. And unfortunately, think of those fields you saw, could be neurology, could be experimental psychology, could be uh, linguistics. They can't publish in, uh, in education journals. They're not gonna get their tenure and the pay raises or whatever. They have to publish in the high tier journals within their own field. So a lot of times this stuff isn't enough. Some of it is, but a lot of it is not making it into in, in the educational journals. Um, and I mentioned about the different fields already. Okay, sorry, that's a little bit redundant. All right, so let's let's talk about reading, word reading. Let's get to the most basic level of the nature of word reading. We have an alphabetic writing system. Chinese, China has about 20 different languages in that country. The two main ones in the West, we refer to one as Cantonese, the other as Mandarin, Mandarin being more common. Now you can have two people, if their only language, if one person's only language is Mandarin, the other's only language is Cantonese, they can't really verbally communicate. They're, they're very different. However, the two of them could stand side by side and read the same menu or read the same newspaper. How does that happen? Well, it happens because that writing system, the Chinese writing system is not as based on little, each picture is a separate word. Um, now this is not, this is only an analogy. Uh, it's not perfect, but it's almost like if you go anywhere in, if we go anywhere in the, the world and you go through an airport, you have these little iconic little icons and they mean the same thing everywhere. Men's room, women's room, luggage, rental car, et cetera. Um, well, in a sense, and again, it's not a good analogy totally, but that's what Chinese is like. Each little character represents a word. So in Cantonese, you may say it very differently than you would in Mandarin, but alphabetic writing is very different. You see, we don't write words in English or Spanish or French or any other alphabet. We write phoneme characters. Now, phonemes, just to be clear, phonemes are the smallest unit of spoken language that allows us to distinguish one word from another or one syllable from another. So uh, you have to pardon my upstate New York accent here with some of the, particularly the vowels, but had and hat, had and hat, they differ by a phoneme, but each of those is one enclosed syllable. So the phonemes all, the fancy word they use is co-articulate. They all blend together as one unit. It's just one singular syllable, but you can distinguish between that syllable had and hat by what's called a phoneme. So it's a bit of an abstraction. Um, hid and had differ by a phoneme. Had and sad differ by a phoneme. But in each of those cases, you're talking about one unit of speech, which is the syllable. So that's what phonemes are. And that's what we capture when we write in an alphabetic based writing system. So th the term alphabetic is not very useful. It's basically represents the first two letters of the Greek alphabet, alpha and beta. So it's not telling us much about the nature of the writing. We should call it a phonemic writing system because that's exactly what it is. It was intended to capture the sounds we make when we speak words. And now instead of having to learn thousands and thousands of characters like you did in, like you do in Chinese, or you had to do in, uh, you know, Egyptian hieroglyphics or cuneiform. Now you only have to learn, you know, 22, 26, 27, 29 letters, depending on which alphabet, some are a little bit bigger than that. Um, so the, what we do is we write phoneme characters and we have those phoneme characters in a sequence. And then that sequence represents that spoken word. So if you have poor access to the phonemic structure, the spoken language, you don't need phonemic awareness to speak. You need what's called phoneme discrimination. You need to be able to discriminate or determine the difference between had and hat. And that comes by about six months of age for most kids. But you don't need to be aware of why had and hat are different. You just need to know that they're different. Well, when it comes to a written language based on the phonemic structure of the spoken language, you need to know, you need to be aware of the individual sounds. Now, most people will say, yeah, okay, I can see where phonemic stuff is important for sounding out words, but what's not so obvious is it's also, and I'll go through this, right? It's not obvious. It's very important for how we uh, encode, store, whatever you want to call it, remember words, so we don't have to sound them out again. When we read, we are, we're not sounding out words as we go along. The words are popping out at us instantaneously, and it feels like it's some sort of visual memory process, which it's not. We'll see that uh, coming up. But um, 
the memory process of how we get those words into our memory so they jump out instantly, the phonemic skills are very essential to that process. Again, it's not obvious as to why that is, but we have um, determined that over the last four decades. All right, we have two levels of word reading. It's very important that we distinguish those. One level of word reading is uh, the ability to identify an unfamiliar word by sounding it out. Identifying an unfamiliar word by other cues is very unreliable. They've been in study after study after study and shows it's very unreliable, it's very hit and miss. Now, if you sound out a word, it's not a guarantee you're going to get it, but we use uh, context, uh, the words we learned, we've used context. So say, for example, the child's reading something and they, that says, the family drove the car to the Marquette. Now, obviously they're not thinking about a university up in Wisconsin, right? But what, what is the child going to do? They're gonna go, oh, oh, market. So when they sounded it out letter by letter, sound by sound, they were able to get a word close enough so that they knew it was market and then they move on. Now, if we decided to guess based on context, now context helped, it facilitated after tracking through the whole word. But if we wanted to just guess based on say the first letter in context, you'd have a child be saying the family drove to the museum. And how far does the child have to keep reading before they realize they're talking about vegetables and not about dinosaurs in a museum or whatever? So it's very inefficient. There are thousands of words that begin with M. Uh, and so tracking through the word and coming to it, either getting it immediately by sounding it out or getting a close enough phonetic approximate that allows context to resolve that. That is a skill that, that good uh, readers who are, or competent readers have that skill. And then secondly, the ability to remember words. So when we read words, we once we figure them out, believe it or not, from second grade on, studies show that children only need to see brand new words one to four times. That's it. Uh, now, uh, not the kids I worked with, okay, but the kids I, I work with when I do research studies, because when, when I do studies, I, I work with, uh, I gather data on typically developing readers as well as struggling readers. But that's it, one to four exposures. Now, if that seems kind of surprising, consider kids might enter kindergarten or go from kindergarten to first grade. They might know what, 50 words, 100 words, 200 words. But then they enter third grade two years later, and now they know anywhere from two to four or 5,000 words. If you do the math, they, they didn't see all those 5,000 words or 3,000 words 18, 20, 30 times, you know, other than the high frequency ones. So it's pretty amazing. Skilled readers are very good at remembering words after only a few exposures from about second grade on. Not struggling readers. Struggling readers are poor at both of these. Some struggling readers that get some intensive phonics instruction might be good at the first, but they're not good at the second. And if you're good at both, you're not a poor reader. I mean, you may have difficulty with comprehension, but then that ends up being issues related to language or background knowledge or vocabulary. But in terms of word reading, these are the two skills. Now, contrary to our intuition, these are related to each other. The, the, the second one builds upon the first, but it does add something important. Let me show you what I mean. This is, um, uh, it, this looks like old data. It was something that was easy to scan. Uh, that's why, a little bit lazy on my part. But the new Wechsler, uh, the Wechsler uh, Individual Achievement Test that just came out this fall, their data looks just like this. I got to look at their um, their scatter plots just like this. So, so this is how the, this works. You, you see the from the one to 40 going up vertically, they gave these kids 40 words that were exception words. These are words like iron, yacht, either you knew them or you didn't. If you sounded it out in isolation, it there's no context to help you, you're gonna get it wrong. But if you already had it stored in your long-term memory, that's what this was designed to do, to kind of get an estimate of which kids already have a lot of words stored. And then across the bottom are those uh, nonsense words. Those are pronounceable, pronounceable non-words like blat and prop. And they're, they test to find out if a child can sound out a word because it's not a real word. If you use a real word, they may have seen it before. And if they get it right, it's, may, it's not telling you anything about their ability to sound out a new and unfamiliar word. Well, look what they found. They found that the children that were uh, weak at sounding out words were also the ones weak at remembering words. And the children who were good at remembering more, excuse me, good at sounding out words were also good at remembering words. And then you have that uh, a third group, which I alluded to in the last slide, some children 
I'm presuming this here, that they got some good phonics training. So they were good at sounding out words, but they weren't good at remembering words. So the, so the ability to that, that first of the two levels of skill is a necessary, but not sufficient skill to have to be good, a good word level reader. See, nobody there. There's nobody there. And if you ever find a child from third grade on who is really good at remembering words, but can't sound out simple CVC nonsense words, like, you know, like I said, or, or whatever, blat, prop, things like that, uh, please alert me to that because there are researchers around the world that want to find that kid and study it, but they haven't found him or her yet. Okay. It's kind of like in the unicorn category. Um, all right. So here's a question science needs to answer. Uh, educated adults have about 40 to 60,000 words, adults across the board, between 20 and 70,000 words in their orthographic lexicon. What's an orthographic lexicon? It's a fancy way of saying all the words in the data bank of familiar words that are in our memory system. That's all. So words that we don't have to sound out, guess at, they jump out at us as soon as we see them. That's our uh, lexicon is just a fancy term for dictionary. So the next time someone says to you, what's another word for thesaurus, say lexicon, and then you kind of run their little joke. But anyway, they, they, so that's a, the, the data bank of familiar words that we have. For the rest of tonight, I'm going to assume that all of us participating in this have a 50,000 word data bank, right? Uh, now, of those words, of those 50,000 words you and I know, I want you to think for a moment. What percentage of them, when you first came across them, could have been second grade, fifth grade, could have been in high school, could have been a few weeks ago if it was some new technical term or a word you never saw before. What percentage of those 50,000 words, when you first saw it, did you put some conscious effort into remembering it for the next time? Now, I obviously can't get feedback on this, but based on my experience with posing this question to thousands of people, the answer is not very many, a very small percentage. Think about it. When we're reading, we come across the new word. And once we identify the word, do we run and get flashcards? Do we cover it up, look up at the ceiling, go back up, down? No, we move on. The minute we know what the word is, we move on. And after, after one to four exposures for kids from second grade on, uh, of that type of exposure, from then on, it's immediately uh, memorable, okay? So science needs to uh, address this. Think about this. That means that remembering words for later retrieval, building that, uh, another term teachers might use for it is sight vocabulary, building that those words that jump out at us upon sight or instantly, that's happening behind the scenes. It's unconscious and it's automatic. And, and that's important to realize. Um, this is not like when we had to learn all those Spanish verbs or French verbs in, 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 in high school, right? Or college. It's not like when we had to learn state cap capitals and memorize them or math facts. Those took very conscious effort over and over and over, not one to four exposures, but dozens of exposures for, for many of them, right? So it's a very different kind of learning. It's called orthographic learning, by the way. Uh, and it's a bit different than you know just straight memorization because that's not how we learned it. So as I said, this requires an explanation. And by the end of tonight, I will give you our best explanation that we have. And I think it's pretty good. It's very functional and makes, makes good sense of a lot of data. So um, this phenomenon of building that orthographic lexicon is not something that is addressed in any current educational philosophy that I know of, no products, no program. So what needs to happen is teachers administrators need to learn about this process because think about it this is what we do when we read we're not sounding out words as we go along the big elephant in the room i think when it comes to reading is how come we have these kids that can remember words after just seeing them a couple times and other kids can't the issue of memory for words should be central in our mind because that's the end goal when it comes to word reading the end goal for reading is comprehending but one of the best routes to being good at comprehending what you read is to not let the words get in the way. Because if you put a lot of time and energy into trying to figure out the words, that's less working memory space you have available to understand what you're trying to read. It's like a trying to multitask. Okay, what are the skills needed for that? I wanna say this, and I'm gonna go through this quickly, but uh, I used to, um, for many years, this at the top, I used to say it, First nine years working as a school psychologist. Makes perfect sense, doesn't it? No, nope. <laughs> it's not. It's illogical. It confuses teaching and learning. Yeah, children can learn to read in different ways and, and be lousy readers. But if you're talking about learn to read proficiently in different ways, learn to be good readers, no. Um, uh, teaching and learning aren't the same thing. Teaching is what 
we do and learning is something that goes on between their ears so to learn proficiently there's really only one way and and once you see some of this folks it's amazing we can even do this so here's here's some of the things that we can do we can perceive a word flashed on a screen for 1 20th of a second followed by a bunch of x's or hashtags to cancel out any after image on our retina and yet we can we can read the word in 1 20th of a second with about 95 percent accuracy um, we can read 150 to 250 words a minute. That's quite a clip. We have, as I said, on average, about 50,000 educated people have about 50,000 words stored away, right? Do you, do you have, you know, uh, there aren't too many other bits of information in any given area that, that reach that level. A new word after one to four exposures. And then another bullet that's missing here, I just realized, is once we learn a word, we don't forget it. When was the last time you saw a word that you used to know and used to jump out at you and you're looking at it going, oh, darn, I got to sound this out again. No, but yet think of all the things we forgot. We've, you know, all the, can you still name all the state capitals, right? You still remember all those Spanish words you had to learn? So the orthographic learning is really amazing. There aren't two or three or four ways for that to happen. So when I used to say that, and I've heard many people say that, oh, children learn to read in different ways. No, folks, it's amazing kids can learn to read we can we can learn to read the way we do um, all skilled readers have the same basic skills the ones i just mentioned they're good at sounding out nonsense words which is our way of indicating that children are good at um, coming across the new word and figuring it out and just as a little side note i know that in the educational field there are a number of people that feel very uncomfortable with the concept of nonsense words um, it's almost as if they're afraid somebody's advocating for us to say to the kids, okay, kids, let's sit down here. And we're going to do 20 minutes of nonsense word paragraph reading. You know, what, what's that all about? No, no. Let me just say that because uh, I think people think nonsense words are inauthentic, and that's incorrect, by the way. Uh, nonsense words are very authentic in two different uh, ways. Number one, every new word a child has not seen before is functionally a nonsense word. And that's exactly why we use them for assessment to determine how good are you at dealing with attacking figuring out a new word based upon your knowledge of the code. Secondly, the world is not made up of single syllable words. And if you consider multi all the multi syllabic words kids have to learn, um, many of those are what you would call nonsense syllables. So take a word like remember. Ber is not a word burr. Mem isn't a word, M-E-M, -E either is R-E. Okay, so, so nonsense words, you might say, are, are quite authentic, but they, the ones, the two examples I gave you are integrated in with real reading. So um, anyway, kids that are good at sounding out nonsense words, the correlation between how good you are at sounding out nonsense words and how good you are at real words is extremely high. I don't know if you don't all know much about correlations, but you're talking somewhere between about 0.7 and 0.9, depending on the age range and et cetera. So uh, being good at one means you're gonna be good at the other. And then all skilled readers are good at remembering, you know, the more they read and they counter new words, those words keep getting added to that data bank of familiar words and they become more proficient at reading as they go along. So to do that, for the phonetic decoding, the sounding out words, two things, two things. Uh, assuming, uh, you know, vision and hearing are okay, et cetera, letter sound knowledge and phonemic blending. So a child sees a word like sat and they go sat. You ever had a child do that and they look at you and go, what's the word? And you're like, what's the word? You just sounded it out, right? That child has a blending problem. So they're hearing sat and it's not jumping out at them. So that's, that's blending. So the, the child had letter sound knowledge, but they didn't have blending. So if you have the two of them, you can go sat, oh, sat. And then orthographic mapping. Now, um, let me back up because you saw the word orthographic before. Orthographic is just a very fancy way of saying, talking about letter order. It comes from two Greek words, orthos, which means straight or correct, and orthodonta straightens your teeth, right? And graphos, which we use it to mean like a picture, like a graphic, but originally in classical Greek, it meant like scratches or markings and eventually became used to refer to their letters of the alphabet. So uh, in its original sense, it fits perfectly. So straight alphabetic letters, correct alphabetic letters. Orthographic mapping means that we're anchoring a, the correct sequence of letters into our long-term memory and remembering words. I'll describe how that happens a couple slides from now. But the two skills that are needed are letter sound proficiency. And when I mean proficiency, I mean automaticity. You don't even have to think about it. It just can happen. And phonemic proficiency. Now, I'm going to 
pause here and come back to those, describe those in more detail a few slides from now after I show you how the orthographic mapping process works. And then it's going to make much more sense. So orthographic mapping is the mental memory process that we use to store words for instantaneous retrieval uh, later on. And interestingly, it also applies to parts of words. So um, for example, in various studies, they would expose uh, kids second or third grade that are good readers to nonsense words uh, like N-A-L-K. And the skilled readers would say knock. The first graders would say nelk because they try to go letter by letter by letter. But the, but the older kids said knock, immediately said knock. I mean, they come back with these nonsense words, these single syllable nonsense words like lightning as if they were real words. That's how, that's how proficient it becomes. Um, now, why do they say knock? Well, because by that point, they've seen the word talk and walk, and they have stored A-L-K in to, uh, to that pronunciation. So what I'm about to describe to you, this mapping process applies to whole words, but also to uh, meaningful units. When I say meaningful units, in this case, what we call a, a rhyme unit, R-I-M-E, that would be A-L-K. Uh, that's a vowel and anything after the vowel. So orthographic mapping is the, the memory mechanism that builds that data bank of familiar words. And other than visual input of the letters, visual memory is not involved much at all. The two visual skills kids need are at the, at the preschool level for the most part. You need number one, visual discrimination. You have to be able to distinguish between say uh, a lowercase t and a lowercase f. And you know what the difference is? You gotta point out to that little preschooler, one has a little hook at the top, right? And we have other letters that are different. And if kids can tell that they're different, that's visual discrimination. You need that skill. If you can't tell the difference between a lowercase t and a lowercase f, you're not gonna be able to read. The second thing you need is um, uh, uh, some sort of visual retrieval of something familiar. So if you say to the child, you point to a letter of the alphabet and say, have you ever seen this before? And if the kid says no, even though they have, that's a problem, okay? But even if children can't come up with the name, they may, you may point to a letter and they may have seen it before and they failed to retrieve the name. Folks, that's not a visual memory problem. That is a phonological retrieval. Now, I use the word phonological here. I don't think I used it yet. I want you to, be, to know what that is. I use the word phony. But phonological, it comes from a Greek word phonos, which means uh, voice or sound. And it refers to the sound properties of spoken language. So auditorily, we take in all kinds of things. Uh, you know, a plane flying over, you know, a, a coin dropping on the ground and people's voices. Well, people's voices are a subset of auditory information that has to do with the sounds of spoken language, both us producing them as well as us uh, perceiving them. And any speech pathologist uh, out listening, they know they probably took, I know in our, our university, they take an entire course just on phonology, um, more to do with pr producing the sounds. But anyway, um, so the, the, uh, the, if you fail to retrieve something, and we do that all the time, right? You look at something across the table and go, oh, give me the, uh, uh, the thingy there. You know exactly what it is. It's not a visual memory issue. It's a phonological retrieval issue, okay? So that's what we need. In order to be able to read, you need to be able to, visually, you need to be able to distinguish one letter from another, and you have to be able to recognize that you've seen that letter before. And then you have to be able to attach the sound, but now you're getting out of the visual realm and getting into the pairing of the visual with a phonological memory of, of that particular letter. So the visual aspect of learning to read is, is very, very basic. Now, a guy named David Sher, University of uh, Haifa in Israel, he and his mentor developed this concept called the self-teaching hypothesis. This is his point. We teach ourselves most of the words we know. Think about it. If you know 50,000 words, how many did your teachers teach you or your parents? I don't know, several hundred, maybe a couple thousand. Let's say a couple thousand and they directly they directly. have a meeting. You. Oh, someone's, <laughs> someone needs to. So they directly taught you uh, maybe I'm going to say 2,000, which is probably a stretch. How did you learn the other 48,000? You taught yourself. I taught myself. What does that mean? That means that exactly what I described earlier. You come across the word. You sound it out. If, if there's some ambiguity, and there are other reasons for ambiguity, the, the one I gave you with you know, market and marquette is because that's a phonetically regular word, but we have to pay attention to the fact that 
in multi, many multisyllabic words, almost all three syllables or more, and most two syllable words, there's a vowel reduction in the non stressed syllable. That's why it's market and not marquette. So, and we also have ambiguity with irregular words. We'll come back to that. And we have ambiguity with um, uh, homographs like dove and dove and present and present. So context helps us determine which. Regardless, we come across the word, we sound out through the whole word, we get as close as we can, we figure it out and we move on and that's it. That's how reading works. And after a couple of exposures in that situation, and by the way, the studies that found out kids only need one to four exposures, those were very authentic type studies that were done where children were reading paragraphs with newly new words embedded in them one time, four, four times, or two times, four times, six times, eight times. They found no difference if it was four times or six times uh, or eight times. But they did notice an improvement between one and two and two and four. The biggest uh, jump, by the way, the, the most traction they got, believe it or not, was with the first and second exposure. It's, it's an amazing process. So we teach ourselves to read by reading. If you have the mechanics of being able to sound out a word, uh, and, and that's a, that's a, um, a key factor to that. Uh, we learn one at a time. There's no batch processing. So it's not like if the child struggles at remembering words, you can wave a magic wand over the head and the next day they're going to be a good reader. No, they need to take the time to get exposed to text and store all those new words that they're encountering. So as students sound out new words, their connections, orthographic, meaning the letter order connections are being made in a way that I'll describe on the next slide. Um, if the newly encountered words are not sounded out, they came up with a clever way to study that. Uh, the words are poorly remembered. So if the children don't sound out the word, they're far less likely to remember it. It goes from like uh, an, an 85 or 90% likelihood down to about a 30% likelihood if they don't sound it out. And it's important to realize when we say self-teaching, we don't mean kids teaching themselves the code. It presumes that they are competent at using the code. Once children are competent at using the code, the self-teaching process kicks in and children start building that, um, that site vocabulary, orthographic lexicon, whatever your favorite term for it is. And this I talked about earlier, orthographic learning is implicit. Implicit meaning it's happening automatically behind the scenes. I'm not thinking about it. Um, and uh, I mentioned the one to four exposure. So that's what uh, David Shares self-teaching hypothesis gives us the uh, background and the context and the requirement in terms of sounding it out for remembering words. But what he doesn't provide is the actual memory mechanism. So we'll turn to that now. Dr. Linnea Airy, who recently retired from the City University of New York Graduate Center, and used to be at University of California. Back in the, seven, the late 70s, she came up with this idea of how we remember words. And everybody just assumed it was some kind of visual memory, but she didn't. And so throughout the 80s, she did studies to show that she was on track. Starting in the, in the mid 90s, other researchers independent of her said, hey, this looks interesting, but all the studies have been done by the same person. How do we know they're accurate? And so people independently studied it. And that happened for up to about 10 years. And so many studies showed that she was on track and we did not have studies that were inconsistent with that. Um, it's been pretty well established in the research literature. In fact, there have been no studies on it in about the last 10 years, just, just like there haven't been studies connecting cigarette smoking and lung cancer, right? Because we it's already been so well established. Um, so here's what uh, uh, Aries orthographic mapping theory. And by the way, I wanna mention, people get a little nervous about the terms like theory. Like theory sometimes gets used as, well, that's your theory, and that's my theory. It's just some sort of idea. Not in the sciences. In the sciences, we refer to a theory as an explanation for a phenomenon that is very well grounded. So for example, gravity is not a fact. It's a theory. It explains facts. So if I drop something and it hits the, it hits the ground, that's a fact, the fact that it dropped to the ground. But the explanation of that fact is what's called a theory. And I don't think anybody think, now let's put it this way, gravity is a pretty darn good theory, wouldn't you say? So don't get hung up on that. It's very well established. It fits the evidence very well. So according to uh, orthographic mapping, we are remembering letter orders. We're remembering the order of the letters. It's a familiar letter order. Now we have to distinguish between spelling and reading in this regard. You have to have a better orthographic memory of, um, a word to spell it than you do to read it. And think of all the words we adults can read easily 
but they're very hard to spell. Um, and so with children, they and adults, they come across the word and they remember the order as familiar. So take a look at the word bear. Notice that here in this slide, the word bear visually is very different as you go from one to the next to the next. Doesn't matter. You're not remembering the visual look of the word, you're remembering the, uh, the order, the letter order. And as long as all these letters are legible to you, if a child, take for example, the very last presentation of the word bear. Look, look at that R. I mean, is that, that could almost be a V. What is it? Maybe even a letter I if there were a dot up there. As long as the child knows that that's an R, they can read it and they can remember it. So it's not the visual look that's important. And look at the first two, the lowercase and uppercase version of bear. Notice how not one single letter in the word bear is the lowercase visually the same as the uppercase. In every example, the uppercase is visually different. So if a child learns the word bear in lowercase, say in first grade, and let's say reading a book for the first time, they come across it themselves in third grade or like a comic strip or something, instantly familiar, but they've never had that visual, uh, they've never seen that visually before. That's a brand new visual stimulus to them, but it's instantly familiar, why? because the letter order is very familiar to them. So it's, it's about the letter order, um, uh, not about the visual look. So words are anchored in long-term memory through a connection process between something that's well-established and something that's new. That is how we learn new things from infancy onward. We connect what we're trying to learn to what we already know. What does the child already know in this case? The pronunciation, they've heard the word even if they don't know the meaning. That's why children where English is in their first language will pick up on the word reading way faster than they'll pick up on the comprehension. I can tell you there are plenty, I studied Spanish in high school and college, I've forgotten most of it, but there are many Spanish words that jump out at me instantaneously and I would have to sit and think and think and I may or may not even come up with what the meaning is. So what happens is these are being anchored to pronunciations. As long as it's a pronunciation that's already stored, a quick example is, you know, I, um, I work at a university, so we got a lot of smart people, all right? Now, I didn't do that great on the SATs, the verbal SATs. I probably did the lowest of anybody at our university, okay? And um, so what happens is I hear these big words that all these smart people use. And, uh, and then I'm like, oh, man, you know, someone says, well, ostensibly, something or other. I'm like, ostensibly? Ostensibly? Like, I'm too dumb to be in this conversation. I don't know what that word means, right? And so normally I would look it up. Nowadays, folks, I have a, I have a dictionary right on my phone. So I get in a conversation with some of these smart people and they say some of those big words and I go, oh, hold on a minute. I'm, I think my wife's texting me here and I can look it up. Not really, I haven't done that yet, but it's a good idea. So I heard the word ostensibly several times verbally. I came across it in print and only maybe once or twice after that, I had instant access to it. I had no idea what it meant. Then finally, this is back in the days before I had apps. I, and, you know, I looked it up in a dictionary and I learned what it meant. So the point is, if you have the pronunciation in your long-term memory system, you have an anchoring point. You're connecting what's new, what's new? Exposure to that sequence of letters is now going to get connected to something that's already stored in your long-term memory. And that's the pronunciation. Just the way any other learning occurs on, on, uh, in that respect. Um, now, phonemic segmentation skills. So segmentation mean, means be able to pull it apart to the level of phoneme. So you have a word like hat, and you have three phonemes, at. But you get a word like shoe. There's four letters, but there's only two phonemes. Sh represents one phoneme, sh, and then oe is just who. Now, the skill of you have to be able to pull these words apart. <laughs> you notice I have that highlighted. Because segmentation skill, don't confuse it with segmentation tasks, the phonemic awareness task. A task is trying to get at a mental process. And some tasks do a better job of getting at that invisible mental process that we can't see than others. And um, as it turns out, segmentation task is not the best way to get at the segmentation skill we need for reading. We know that from correlational studies, because the correlation between segmentation and word reading uh, is much, much lower than other tasks that we use. So we want to go for the tasks that get the closest to uh, that, that skill. Anyway, segmentation skill, what is it? You pull it apart. So if a child sees a word, can they pull apart the pronunciation that they have in long-term memory so that they connect that pronunciation to the printed letter? Can they do that? If they can't, learning those words is going to be really hard. So let me show you what it looks like. These are what are called transparent words. Don't get that confused with phonetically regular, irregular. 
That's for phonics, that's for sounding it out. I'm talking about remembering words. Transparent means there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between letters and sounds. Nice, neat fit. Now, um, no, when you see in, in things related to reading, when you see a slash mark on either side of a letter, it refers to the pronunciation of the letter, not the letter itself. So if you see a slash mark on either side of the S, that's not the letter S, that's S. Well, I've kind of stolen that little convention and I used it here. This is not the printed word read you're looking at. It is the, the spoken word read that you have stored in your long-term memory. So up there that PLTM stands for phonological long-term memory, meaning it's something in your long-term memory that you've heard before. So a child has heard the word read, it's already stored. Now, what we wanna do is make use of that, leverage that stored memory uh, to try to remember the printed word. Now, if a child can hear different sounds within the word, that's what we call phoneme awareness or analysis. And phoneme analysis is when you pull it apart. Blending is when you put it together. It's a different process, goes in the opposite direction. And if you can hear there's a d at the end of red, if you can hear there's an e in the middle or a r at the beginning, now in your memory system, you have anchoring points. You have little shelves, so, so to speak, to organize, to connect to. And when you see the printed word read, you have a ready system within your memory to make that familiar and connect it to the spoken word read. And you don't have to sound it out anymore. Now red gets treated as a unit, R-E-D. But then you see for the very first time, rid, it kicks it out. I don't know that. I have to learn that one. Or rod, no, nope, kicks it out. I don't know that. I got to sound it out and go through the process, that memory process. And then you get a word like has. And you can hear the sounds, has, and you may go, huh, I would have expected a Z, but no, there are plenty of words where the S at the end makes a Z sound, isn't, aren't there? Plurals, possessives, and others. Um, and there you go. You're making those connections. So let me show you how David Shares and Aries theory work together. So with David Share, you got a word like drift. If you have letter sound knowledge, you can go D, R, I, F. Now, as I said much earlier, chances are by the time you're reading words like this, if has already been stored as a unit because of, uh, you know, if, because you've already learned the word lift. And then the dr, there are a number of words you probably would have learned with dr. So it's just dr. So for the child, it's really more dr, if, but I'm, I'm using it here just to illustrate a point. So if you have letter sound knowledge, you can identify the sounds most likely uh, in, in that case. Um, you know, obviously there's some irregularities and, and we'll talk about that. If you have blending, look what you can do. You can go, oh, drift. Now I know what the word is. But what's happening is in the background that uh, behind the scenes, we are activating the phonemic skills. Once you know it's the word drift, you can't do the phony uh, orthographic mapping unless you know what the word is you're looking at. Now that I know it's the word drift, I can connect those sounds to that spelling pattern. And after one to four exposures, it becomes a familiar word and I don't need to sound it out anymore. And if I see draft, I got to start over again. I got to sound out draft. I don't say drift. All right. Now, you know, kids that aren't good with the orthographic learning, they're going to just say what looks what it looks like. All right. Now we have words that are opaque. I, I didn't come up with these, by the way. <laughs> opaque means there's not a one-to-one -one correspondence. You have a word like make. We have a problem because there are four letters, but only three sounds. So we have to make an adjustment. And this is going to be important when we talk about irregular words. Even with phonetically regular words, we have to make adjustment for it to be stored in our long-term memory. We have to note that the pronunciation has three phonemes in it, but the word is represented with four phonemes. So we adjust. And now knowing the silent E rule, I have to believe is going to be very useful here. Um, and then you have read, read, same thing. We have to make a different kind of adjustment here. Same situation in that there are three sounds, but four letters, but the adjustment is very different, isn't it? So there we go. There's the R and then read. Um, then you have an irregular word like comb. Hmm. We have the same problem that we have with make. Comb is phonetically irregular, but we have the exact same adjustment needed to connect it to our memory system. Again, I have to believe that the silent E makes it a little easier in that regard. And the reason I say have to believe is because we don't have research that that's specific to answer that very question. So I have to guess, make an educated guess. But what we 
C is going to happen is you're going to do the exact same thing with comb that you do with make. You just don't have that little extra knowledge piece knowing about the silent E. Now, granted, there are a lot of MB words and the B is silent, but not enough to make a rule like the silent, you know, like the silent E rule. So that's what we have to realize about irregular words. It, it's been shown to take a couple extra exposures for typically developing readers, but not dozens, not like dozens of extra times, only a couple of extra exposures for those to get mapped into long-term memory for, for typically developing readers. Most irregular words are only off by one element, like the case of comb, like on the word put. It's just that middle vowel sound is not what you'd expect. A child is going to read that. They're going to say, put, put the book on the, oh, oh, put the book on the table. Now, once the child knows it's really put, that orthographic mapping process is kicking in and they're hearing the sounds in the pronunciation put and they're connecting it to that string of letters. So after that, they're not going to say put, they're going to say put. Um, so there's usually only one. The, the, the number of words in English that have multiple violations are, are way less common than you'd think. Uh, there are some real doozies, like the second most common word in English based on a 1995 word count of, of dozen, you know, hundreds of different books is the word of O-F. Shouldn't it be U-V? So there's no connection. I mean, you have two letters and they're both irregular. So there's definitely problems, but there are far fewer words than you might guess where there's more than one quote unquote violation. So irregular words aren't a challenge for orthographic mapping. This is what Ari herself has said. Exception words or irregular words are only exceptional when someone tries to read them by applying a phonetic decoding strategy. When they are learned as sight words, they are secured in memory by the same connections as regularly spelled words. Just like comb and make. Both of them are anchored in the same way. One's regular, one's irregular. That's different. See, the reason why it's a problem for phonetic decoding is because when you see an irregular word, you are given inadequate information to sound that out properly. But once you know what it is, now you go in the other direction. You go from the pronunciation, the individual elements within the pronunciation, and connect that to that printed letter sequence, and it becomes familiar uh, after just a couple of exposures. Lots of regular words require similar adjustments. You got the silent E words like I showed you, the vowel digraph like we saw in read, consonant digraphs like shoo, sh, sh, sh. You have to, they have to make an adjustment. Those are all opaque, but we remember them. And then you have all the multi-syllabic regular words. So um, you see the word toward the end there. It's not a holiday, day, the long I, and it's not even holiday, the short I, unless you're emphasizing it. It's a schwa sound. Oh, it's just a quick little oh, holiday. Oh, did you catch that little uh? So uh, we have to make those adjustments with regularly spelled words all the time. So map, uh, so irregular words are problematic for sounding out words. They are not very problematic at all for remembering words. That's good news, by the way. So how does this happen? I would say, in my estimation, and, and maybe other people might disagree, what I'm about to show you is the most important slide of tonight, because it, it helps us understand the underlying skills needed for that orthographic learning or orthographic mapping process. You need two things for orthographic mapping to happen, two skills. One is letter sound proficiency, the other is phonemic proficiency. Now notice how that's different than letter sound knowledge. You'll see the difference in a moment. And phonemic proficiency is a step beyond phonemic awareness. So let's look at letter sound proficiency. By the end of first grade, we have a lot of data on this. I've seen it myself in studies I've done with typically developing kids uh, using what's called the test of word reading efficiency, where they, um, they in one case, they, in 45 seconds, they read as many words off a list, and then in another 45 seconds, as many nonsense words off the list. And these children from first grade on that are typically developing readers, they will see a simple CVC, consonant, vowel, consonant, nonsense word, and they will respond instantly to our, to our ears as fast as if it was a real word. You'd have to do uh, which they've done in studies, you'd have to do millisecond level counting, right? A millisecond, one one thousandth of a second. So what's going to happen is that a child is going to respond in about a tenth of a second to a fifth of a second slower with a, a CVC nonsense word than a real word. Our ears don't catch that tenth of a second, really. So they look at, you see a child sees a word like M-I-P and says MIP instantly. Now stop and think about that for a minute. How did the child do that so fast? They had to retrieve the, si the, the sound for the M, the sound for the I, the sound for the P, and then blend them together. 
but it's more complex than that. Not only did they have to retrieve those sounds, they had to retrieve the correct sound for the I. They didn't say mic, they said MIP. But had there been that silent E on the end, they would have said mic, not MIP. That's pretty fast. That gives me a fair sense that the child was not putting conscious effort into retrieving each of those sounds and was probably not putting conscious effort into blending those sounds together. That is letter sound proficiency. By contrast, you have a child at the end of first grade that looks at MIP and says, mm, eh, MIP. That child is normatively more at a early mid first grade. They're half a year or more behind. But what do they have? Letter sound knowledge. So letter sound knowledge, as essential as it is, it's not enough. You have to have letter sound proficiency to be good at the mapping process because it's happening instantaneously. When we're reading or a child's reading, as soon as they know what that word is, they move on. They don't stop and study. So you have to have letter sound proficiency and phonemic proficiency. Let me explain that. Now, there's a, a, a test that you can use with children. It's called the Phonological Awareness Screening Test, P-A-S-T, Phonological Awareness Screening Test. It's free online. It's uh, at, at the, you have to put the the in there, the past, like P-A-S-T, thepasttest.com, thepasttest.com. So you give a test like that, and that is going to test for phonemic proficiency. And for a while, it was really the only one we had available. Now there's a subtest on the Wechsler Individual Achievement Test that's kind of based on this, but um, so on, the, on this, you start out with children, you say, you start out with easy things, say baseball, but don't say base, ball, right? Then you get to some harder things, say cat. Now say cat instead of k, say sat. Then you get to even harder things, say clap without the k, lap. So you're ha having them delete sounds or substitute sounds. Then you get to some of the harder items and you say like, say sky, sky. Now say it again instead of k, say l, sly. From late second grade on, or in, definitely third grade on, children, even though they've had very little exposure to this, they just started out with say baseball, don't say base. Now we're two or three, we're three minutes into this test. And for the first time, they're getting that kind of item and they're responding instantaneously. Now I want you to think for a moment about what the child needs to do to respond in one second to that item. They have to do what we call phoneme segmentation. They have to pull sky apart. Sky. They cannot move forward without having those separated to the other aspects. Then they have to do what researchers call phoneme isolation. Phoneme isolation is where you isolate. Where am I hearing that? He wants me to get rid of the k and put on a little. Where is that k? Is it the beginning, middle, and oh, there it is in the middle. Then the third thing you have to do is what's called phoneme substitution. So you take that k out and put in a little. Now you have a different sequence of sounds left over. So you have to do phoneme blending. That's four classic phonemic awareness tests, so to speak, or tasks in one second response. That gives me a lot of confidence that the child has immediate, automatic, unconscious access to the phonemes in, in, in that word. How else could they do it that fast? I can't tell you how much time each of those four take, but together they take one second. That means it's a, on average about a quarter of a second. Do I know for certain that it's automatic? No, but I'm pretty confident because they responded so quickly. Compare that to a child doing the segmentation task I talked about earlier. Let's say if you said to the child, tell me all the sounds in sky, and the child goes, I. is it automatic or not? You go, I don't know, it's pretty quick. Maybe it was automatic. You have no way of knowing. We have no way of knowing because there's more ways the child could respond to that than sim simple automaticity. They could have tracked through the word sky as they were going along. Just like if you were to say, um, I'm gonna have you count from one to uh, five as fast as you can, ready, go. One, two, three, four, five. Do you think all one through five popped into their head or do you think they tracked through it? So, uh, you know, the, the point I'm trying to make is it's a conscious task trying to get at an unconscious process. It doesn't work very well. So when you are doing the, the manipulation, like going from sky to sly, you're doing a conscious task of something else. The segmentation part is not clear to the child and it's not conscious, but it's happening anyway. But if you say, tell me all the sounds in the sky, you're bringing out a conscious task. All right, with that said, that uh, I think that's the big reason why the phoneme manipulation tasks correlate with reading uh, from, if, if you have that timing element, uh, if, if correlations mean much to you, 0.5, 0.6, 
on all the word reading subtests on the new Wechsler from kindergarten through 12th grade. But the classic segmentation task, as I told you, it's not as good. It's going to be about 0.5 in first grade, kindergarten, first grade, then it's going to drop down to about 0.3 and it's going to stay there at 0 0.3, 0 0.2 all the way up to high school. So it's just not telling us as much about the process. So this gives us a clue about how this whole process works. I think this helps answer the question when you take these skills and you talk and you see what Ari's talking about, that answers the question of how we can store words lightning fast without even thinking about it. Remember what I posed earlier? We're reading words and we're coming across these words, we're sounding them out and then we're moving on. We're talking about a split second opportunity to connect the pronunciation to the print. That's it. And so if the, the, the letter sound proficiency, or I should say if the letter sound skills are automatic, proficient, and if the phonemic skills are automatic, proficient, then that's happening behind the scenes. And that explains the phenomenon that I described earlier. One of the things that's important to realize is children with reading problems do not have letter sound proficiency, even if they have letter sound knowledge, and they do not have phonemic proficiency. Those are the missing links for them. So they're not good at remembering words. Now, that leads to a whole nother issue. I'm only going to do one slide on it, is reading fluency. So we think reading fluency, a lot of the stuff that we do in schools is to try to get kids just to like practice, practice, practice. And it's not, it hasn't been working. Um, the research on just having kids practice reading, if they're not good at remembering words, we don't see the narrowing the gap at all. Very little, little progress. They may get better if you do like a repeated reading, uh, they may get better at the, um, uh, the passage that they're working on. Two reviews in the Journal of Learning Disability came out in 2017. Remember, a review is where they sit down and look at a whole bunch of studies and look for trends. In both reviews, if you read the abstract, this is a little scary. If you read the abstract, you would think that repeated reading was a real go-to approach. And believe me, I, I used to think that myself, and I was very disappointed with all that I've read on that. I was hoping I was pulling for it. So it's not like I had a bias, but um, basically what they said was the evidence showed that helped children with practice passages, but there wasn't much evidence of carryover to new passages. So it, 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 here's why. If a child is good, let me back up. If a child struggles in um, remembering words, when they come across words, and I, I, I don't mean to use a crude uh, metaphor here, a mixed metaphor, but words are going in one ear and out the other. They're seeing it, maybe they're getting it, but they're not going to necessarily remember it the next time. Why? Because they don't have that ability to anchor the word in long-term memory. They're not good at orthographic mapping. The flip side, so, so what I'm getting at is practice is not an efficient way to build fluency for children that aren't good at remembering words. But if your child is really good at remembering words, the best way to help them become better at reading is to read more. Because the more they read, the more words they encounter, the more words that new words they encounter, they, they continue to build that orthographic lexicon. So um, site vocabulary size, or the size of the orthographic lexicon, appears to be the primary element when it comes to vocabulary. If a child has a large sight vocabulary, words are popping out at them. They're not putting much effort into it and they can read very accurately and they can read very quickly because they're automatic. But if a child has a limited sight vocabulary, there are a lot of words that they don't know and they're trying to sound out and guess, et cetera, and it slows them down. That's not the only factor, but that seems to be the, the, the impo most important factor. The National Reading Panel talked about fluency they mentioned how it, it is a very important aspect uh, of reading that is going to help promote comprehension. Uh, they said a number of things they could define fluency as having to do with speed, accuracy, and prosody. Prosody is that sing-song voice when you read and when we talk. And um, they, um, But what they didn't tell us is give us details as to why some kids are fluent and why they're not. And so it wasn't until after the reading panel came out that a number of, of researchers down at Florida State University, which is a funding hub, for these types of things for the National Institute of Child Health and Development. And they said, hey, I think the site vocabulary size is a huge part of this. And there's, I don't have the time to go over it now, but there's some pr pretty good research evidence to support the notion. Now, some may, some may have heard, oh, isn't reading experience and, and RAN, rapid automatized naming, aren't those related to uh, the, the um, fluency? And the answer is, yeah, they are. 
But the problem is they're also related to the size of the site vocabulary. So you can't tease those out quite simply in a simple additive model. We can't directly deal with the child, child with poor rapid automatized naming, and we can't control how much reading experience a child gets outside of school. However, we can build the skills kids need to become good at remembering words, at which point reading experience becomes so beneficial because the more they read, the more words they add, and, and the better they get. It's like a positive snowball effect. All right, why is word reading easy for some kids and not others? Why, why is that? Well, I wanna to talk to you about this big bad word dyslexia. Um, as you probably know, somewhere in the range of about 45 states now have special dyslexia legislation. There are a bunch of different definitions out there. And uh, there's some popular ones that uh, really are not useful. Uh, some organizations, the International Dyslexia Association has a very good one. In fact, a number of states uh, just simply borrowed the International Dyslexia Association definition for their state definition. I'm gonna give you what I call a researcher definition. After having read hundreds of research articles in this area, I'm gonna to describe to you how researchers describe dyslexia. And I will tell you that not all researchers even like using the word dyslexia because the popular definitions are so wide of the mark, they feel like using dyslexia, it's gonna con conjure up some of those popular definitions. Other, other researchers just go ahead and use the word dyslexia. So different researchers have a different opinion. Either way, they're talking about the same phenomenon, what some would call a word reading disability. Whoops. We're, uh, basically dyslexia or word reading difficulty is a word level reading difficulty despite adequate opportunity or an effort, but not due to blindness, deafness, emotional disturbance, brain damage, or extremely low IQ. When I say extremely low IQ, I mean that the child cannot understand verbal language. Um, if you can understand that's receptive language, you have at least some building blocks to, to learn to read. Um, but so let's just set that aside for now. But the basic idea is that it has to do with um, poor word level reading. That's it. Virtually everything else we hear about dyslexia is popular lore. It, it has nothing to do with seeing things backwards, sideways, reverse. All that stuff is part of we, This has been studied intensively for the last 50 years, and we're not finding any of that, OK? It's poor word reading despite adequate effort and opportunity. That's dyslexia. Or just call it word level reading disabil uh, disability, which some people call it and prefer that for dyslexia. Are there some people that have some visual type things? Yeah, you know, there are people with dyslexia that are lower than average on visual spatial skills, but there are people with dyslexia that are above average in that. There are people that are good readers that are, have low visual spatial perceptual skills and, and some good readers that have strong ones. It, 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 it's not, the, the correlation is extremely low and can't explain dyslexia. That's really not a part of it. So if it's a poor word reading and it fits that definition, that is dyslexia by, by the way researchers would define it. I already told you that. Uh, believe it or not, there were some popular uh, people in the literacy field over the last year or so saying dyslexia does not exist. That is really curious. What, in a sense, what it's saying to me is that they're not familiar with what researchers mean when they say dyslexia. It would almost be like saying tallness doesn't exist, shortness doesn't exist. What we're talking about is a continuum. All the skills involved in re reading, whether it's comprehension or, or word reading, fall on a continuum. And word reading skills fall on a continuum, and dyslexia refers to the bottom end of the continuum. So it's almost like saying there are no such thing as people who are short or tall. When they say dyslexia doesn't exist, I, I don't even know what to make of that, actually, other than that they're not familiar with what dyslexia is. Um, but the, here's the big problem, and that's translating the research into practice. Where do you draw the line? Where do you draw the line and say this person's tall, or draw the line and say this person's short? It's a continuous, what we call a continuous variable is the fancy term we use. It falls on a line, a continuum. It's not like you got the kids with dyslexia over here and then everybody else doesn't have it. No, no, it falls on a continuum. So different states or school districts or even school buildings, depending on how much autonomy they have, or whatever, draw their own line as to how low, what is low enough. In the research community, there is no defined line. Some research studies will define it as, you know, we, you know, define dyslexia as those kids whose scores were in the bottom 10th, 10th percentile, 20th percentile, 30th percentile, and everything in between. I've seen as low as five, I've seen as high as 30, um, and uh, everything in between. So 
that is a problem that research will never be able to answer simply because it's the continuous variable. Now, I do want to make a comment about this, and I think it's great that there's some administrators here. We have to be careful about not selling kids short in this regard. I want to pick up on the low intelligence thing a little bit. What I'm saying about reading applies across all the different disability areas in, in IDEA, Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. Of course, there are two special areas, um, and one is blindness because if children can't see the words, now, as you know, blindness for some people means total darkness, but blindness, legal blindness, um, means worse than 2200 vision with correction. So there are people that have 2200 vision um, that um, even with correction, and they can read very, very large print, okay? So there are some, they, they, they can develop that. It's, it's gonna be a challenge, of course, because of that, and there's going to be more turning of the head. But uh, deafness is a serious issue when it comes to reading because the writing system is based on phonemes that individuals who are deaf aren't perceiving. So those are special cases, but virtually every other case, whether you're talking intellectual disability, speech or language impairment, learning disability, emotional disturbance, um, if you're talking autism, those children can become word readers. There is not a separate set of skills or teaching methods to teach reading for those children as opposed to other children, say with learning disabilities or that don't have a learning dis uh, any disability. Th think of the analogy of basketball. If you were a basketball coach and you held a high school basketball coach and held tryouts, and from those tryouts, you selected a team. And from that team, you selected a starting lineup. You can be pretty sure that the ones who made the starting lineup from the initial pool are among the best at dribbling, passing, shooting, and playing defense. I think that's pretty fair. What if, on the other hand, you were asked to uh, coach a Special Olympics team in high school and you played in a Special Olympics league with other high schools? Now, um, the team that's going to do the best in that league is going to be the team whose players are the best at dribbling, passing, shooting, and playing defense. It's the same. Now, if you're coaching a Special Olympics team, you're going to have some challenges you don't have with the non-disabled team. Uh, maybe having a hard time being understood, maybe, uh, you know, attention lapses, um, maybe motor skills are such that they're going to need more work with that, et cetera. I, I, of course, but the elements are the same. If you want to play basketball, you got to be able to dribble, pass, shoot, and play defense. The same is true here. There, the, the, if, if, let me put it this way. When it comes to word reading, if someone were to ask, why is this child struggling in word? Why can't this child read words very well? The answer should never be because they have an intellectual disability. It's the wrong answer. You could say, well, they have problems with phonemic awareness, letter sound proficiency, they have problems with you know, working memory, rapid automatized naming. There are skills that go into it. Dribbling, passing, shooting, and playing defense. Saying they have an intellectual disability doesn't explain the word reading problem. And here's, here's why I bring this up, because I work K-12 at, at different points in my career. And we would have children who were children, I should say, but they could be 17, 18, 19, and they're getting their final uh, triennial evaluation. And I would do that. And you'd have a child with a mild intellectual disability, say, let's say a 60 IQ. And that child has the language comprehension of more like a fifth grader, even though they're 19 years old. And the child's reading comprehension was at a third or second grade level. Why? Because their, their word reading was at a first grade level. And because they had an intellectual disability, we just assumed the word reading was a result of the intellectual disability when it's not. So think about this. Children, we can we may not get them up to a word level reading of a 12th grader, but we can get them up to a word level reading above their language comprehension. We, if their language comprehension is at a fifth grade level, we want their word reading to be above that. So the, so the word reading does not get in the way. And sending a child out into life with a fifth grade reading comprehension is a lifelong gift that we're giving that child compared to sending them out with a second or third grade reading comprehension. So what I'm talking about here, that needs to be adapted. There are gonna be some behavior management issues in the instruction. I know I worked in a schools, I schools for 28 years, but the, the elements are the same. There aren't separate elements that kids with autism need to know to read words or kids with intellectual disabilities, et cetera. Okay. 
Uh, so I kind of said that I ran ahead a little bit. So it's going to take longer. It's going to be more of a struggle. But think of the trajectory. We want kids to say, if a child's language comprehension is at a, at a fifth grade level, you know, we've got till 12th grade to get them up to a seventh grade word reading level. So, so they have a different trajectory and that's okay. But, but we need to know that they can make those kind of progress. And a lot of people that have worked with kids with special needs, they know, they'll know some kid who is outstanding with the word reading, but they don't comprehend what they read. Um, and, and that we treat those kids as like some sort of savant instead of saying, no, they should be able to learn to read. Um, it's just gonna take longer, it's gonna be harder, of course. And, and they may end at a lower level with the word reading too. So anyway, I jumped ahead and I said that as well. Here's some other information you need to know about ELL students, ENL. E, you know, there's a lot of different terms for that, ESL. There's something called the simple view of reading. Google it, you'll get a ton of stuff. Go to the go to the reading league. And the simple view of reading is very complex, by the way. So some critics of the simple view are saying, well, we think you know, simple view is, is too simple. Well, no, it's only simple at the most base level, which is reading comprehension is based on can you read the words off the page? And can you understand the word if the word of the text if someone read it to you? And if you have both of those in place, your reading comprehension will be fine. Compromise either one of those. And your reading comprehension is going to be compromised. And when it comes to the language comprehension side and the word reading side, it gets extremely complex from there, but at the most base level. And that's true for kids where English is their second language. So children, uh, let's say you have two, two uh, children, two girls starting kindergarten, uh, same level of intelligence. One only knows English and has been in this country her whole life. The other one, the family moved from Mexico a year ago, and she only has a, a, a you know, 1,500 word English vocabulary, so way behind her peers. Research would suggest that by the end of second grade, those two girls, their word reading will be nearly identical, but their reading comprehension will be very different. So the child where English wasn't her first language is still going to lag. And it's going to be about a five to seven year lag on the language comprehension. Um, now that's a nice, neat and tidy example of them starting at the same time. We have kids transferring in second and fifth, et cetera. So things get a little messier. But the point is we have to be very cautious about dismissing word reading problems in ELL students because English isn't their first language. If we see that they're very slow to pick up on this, every people group, every people on every language system have what's called the phonological core deficit that I'm talking about in the next couple of slides. The phonological core deficit means that their access to the phonology, it's on a continuum, is much weaker than their peers and learning to acquire an alphabetic writing system is very hard for them. So let's make sure that we see to it that these kids become decent, at least word readers, and then it's going to take a lot longer for them to develop the language skills. All right, so I just mentioned that term, phonological core deficit. It was often referred to in the research as the most common cause of poor word reading, dyslexia, call it what you want, reading disability. But interestingly, in a 2012 review of dyslexia, they referred to it as a universal cause. I mean, that's quite a shift. Common, most common cause means that there could be a bunch of other things, right? Universal cause seems like it plays a part in every case. Hmm, why'd they do that? Well, um, here's a quote from that that 2012 review, although some individuals with dyslexia have weaknesses in a variety of areas, impaired phonological processing appears to be a universal cause of dyslexia. Now, this came, these people weren't out on a limb. These people were from Florida State University. They're, like I said, they're a funding hub on reading research from the National Institute of Child Health and Development. What is the phonological core deficit? Well, you could divide it up in different ways. No matter how you divide it up, it's the same stuff. It's kind of like a pizza. You know, you can cut it into four pieces or six pieces. It's still the same pizza. So these are the key. This is my what, how I would list the how I would divide up the pizza, so to speak. These are the five characteristics. And one of the reasons why they shifted to referring to it as a universal cause was because um, children that were poor word readers, children that are poor word readers, they um, did not get a clean bill of health on these elements. But kids that are typical word readers, they have no problem with these. These items are a cinch to them, all, all five of them. But children with, the, with, with poor word reading struggle with one and more commonly two or three or all five. That was the first reason. Everybody, every child with the poor reading problem, with poor reading struggle with these. The other thing is they could not find alternatives that really had a causal explanation. 
In other words, th there are what we call, here's the, your big fancy word for this evening, but epiphenomenal. So epiphenomenal means on top of the phenomenon. You, you have children with um, uh, Down syndrome, for example, and they have a very pronounced palm crease that we don't have. Now, none of us would think the palm crease caused the intellectual disability or vice versa. It's epiphenomenal. And so there are things that occur more commonly among individ individuals with dyslexia than in the general population, but they appear to have no causal effect on the reading per se. So this phonological core deficit concept is very consistent with a phoneme-based writing system. What this is basically saying is you struggle with phonemes, you're gonna struggle with reading. A few common misunderstandings I've been coming across that people have about the relationship between phonemic skills and reading. Uh, some think that it's only important, once you've learned basic CVC words, you don't need phonological awareness. Well, that's, I don't, I think we have a lot of research to support that that's not the case. Um, that seems to assume you're talking about blending. Yes, once you get good at the CVC words and blending them together, you don't need that, but that's the blending part. That's what we call synthesis, putting sounds together. At. But the analysis, taking words apart, taking sounds apart, uh, that continues to grow and level out somewhere between third and fourth grade, depending on the study. And uh, the, the, the better the kid's good at that, the more they start picking up on new words. It's assumed to not be word involved in sight, word acquisition. Well, I showed you why it is, okay? Most people don't know that. A lot of people are not familiar with Aries theory and how important the phonemic skills are for that. And therefore, because of the first two, they think it's not important worth training after first grade. Once you're, once you're past first grade, oh, they're, they're too old for that phonemic awareness. Folks, if you don't have it, you're not gonna be good at it. You know, here up in Syracuse, north of you folks, uh, Syracuse University, last year, I didn't count yet for this year, but last year we had six different countries represented on the men's basketball team. Now let's say that um, coach Jim Beheim went to Eastern Europe and got a, a six foot 11 player who was an amazing shooter from three point range foul shooting, et cetera, but he spent his whole life at a barn and his, his, his hoop, his basketball hoop was on the side of the barn and everything was rocky and he never learned to dribble because of that. Do you think he's going to do well? No, but can, can you imagine them saying to coach Behan, just put him in the game. He's too old now to teach him to dribble, right? So a necessary component of being good at basketball is being able to dribble in the same way, a necessary component of being a good reader is to have the phonemic skills for reading. So if you don't have the phonemic skills, I don't care what age you are, you need to work on that because that's a necessary component. Um, so some people think it can't be trained after second grade. That's another thing I've heard. Uh, I don't know where they get this from. Uh, I've heard can't be trained after third grade. I've heard can't be trained after first grade. I've heard all three of those. And I guess if, you, if you're gonna make something up, you pick whatever grade you want, right? I mean, we, we have plenty of evidence that, that phonemic awareness can be trained after second grade uh, and, and, and right into adulthood. Um, and some think there's no causal relationship with reading. And that's tricky um, because in, up until the point where you have proficiency in phonemic awareness, there is a back and forth. For typically developing kids, they learn the phonemic awareness simply by being taught an alphabetic writing system. You teach kids in, in kindergarten, first grade, and you teach them the basic sounding out words, et cetera, what are they doing? They're spending time with, oh, mm, zzz, shh. Those are things that you don't hear in everyday language. You don't hear those in isolation, but now you're breaking up the pronunciations for children and all the phonemic skills that you do start to fall into place. So for typically developing kids, this is true. I mean, it, there's a causal relationship, but it's a back and forth causal, you know, it's, it's in, interactive, you might say, okay? Uh, but for struggling readers, no. Now you can teach, try to teach them an alphabet-based writing system. It doesn't prompt the phonemic skills they're gonna to need to become good at the memory for words, the orthographic learning. Uh, some people think that all you need to do is blending and segmentation, which is basically an ending first grade level. Some people have even referred to doing phoneme deletion and manipulation as just quote unquote mental gymnastics. Um, calling something a name doesn't invalidate any research that supports it. So. Um, uh, yeah, the, um, you heard what I said earlier that phoneme segmentation can't allow us to develop the confidence we need to know that the phoneme skills are automatic. A phoneme deletion or substitution task does allow us that opportunity if the children respond instantly. So that answers the question that people sometimes have. I've heard many times where, wait a minute, we don't, when we read and when we spell, we don't delete sounds and we don't substitute sounds. Well, 
I'm not talking about it for that. I'm talking about it for the component skill of phonemic proficiency and automaticity. So here's why I list this here. And I've been hearing these for the last few years. Every one of these can undermine our efforts. If children need to learn to dribble to play basketball, every one of these is saying, no, just put them out on the court. All right, it's, an, it's a necessary skill. Um, if what Ari's saying is true, that we're connecting pronunciations to print, and her theory has been so well validated, people aren't even studying it anymore. And if we are not putting conscious effort into remembering those 50,000 words, then um, it is, not to get too fancy here and philosophical, but it is deductively correct that that's a necessary skill that you need. And so ev all of these different things here are drawing us away from children developing the phonemic skills enough. Now, a lot of these are from people that are big proponents of phonics, but as we saw earlier, that being able to phonetically decode a word isn't enough. And it only helps us with the first of the two levels of word reading. Now we need to ramp it up to proficiency for that to happen. So why do our most popular reading approaches maybe not do so well? I want to begin with this assumption. We all do the best with what we can and what we know. I did for nine years. I gave pretty bad advice the first nine years, okay? Even my first four years teaching courses on learning disabilities, I wish I could contact all those students and all these years later and say, hey, remember that stuff I told you? Maybe not so much. I got some better stuff for you now, right? But I did the best I could with what I knew. So please, if you feel like your toes are gonna be stepped on with some things I'm gonna say, my toes were stomped on years ago, okay? And But we have to move forward with what the best information that we have available. All right, we have four classic approaches to reading. We can categorize them based on where's the emphasis? What unit of focus is the emphasis on? And they fall on a continuum with those units of focus. So if you're focusing on letters and graphemes, now graphemes is just a way of referring to letters or more than one letter to represent a sound. So like in phonics, the PH is two letters, but it represents one sound, it's a grapheme. Uh, but then the O is a grapheme too. So a single letter or multiple letters that represent a sound. That's the phonic approach. It breaks it down. And then you have where now you're looking at chunks of words, the word family approach or linguistic approach. So now you're combining letters into uh, multiphonemic units. And then words, the whole word approach, which dominated the teaching of reading from the 1820s right up and through up until the 1980s and 90s when whole language took over. And then the sentence method where the focus is on paragraph, whole sentences and paragraphs and context becomes a centrally important part of figuring out the words that you're reading. Um, well, here's what's interesting. Uh, I never like it when people say, well, I've never heard of a study that when everybody, anybody says that, it kind of annoys me because I'm like, really? We have a thousand studies a year. So we've got tens of thousands in, in the bank and you read out every one of them. Okay, so as annoying as I find that, I'm gonna do the same thing right now, okay? But, but, but let me give you the background for it. You know, if you've ever read a research report, the first part, what they call the introduction, it surveys the findings from a whole bunch of other studies. If you read a review, you find, learn the findings from even far more studies. So if, you've, if you read one report, you get the findings from 10 studies. If you read 100 reports, you get the findings from thousands of studies. So I'm not pretending I've turned over every rock, but having read hundreds of reports and having been exposed to the findings from thousands of studies, uh, and any one that I've seen, one of those four has the best results when they're compared in the same study. So if they're in the same study, I've never I, the, I've seen two studies where they had three of those being compared, never seen one with four, but I've seen lots of them with any possible combination you can think of too. And in every case, the best results went to the one that was the closest to the nature of alphabetic writing, which was focusing on the letters and graphemes and phonemes. In every study I've seen or every review I've read, the one that was the weakest was the one that got the farthest from the nature of the alphabetic writing system. And what's interesting is the other two fell in rank order. So the farther you get from the um, phonemic nature, phonemic and orthographic nature of our writing system, the weakest results you get, whether it's general education, instruction or whether it is intervention. Now, the problem with all four approaches is um, 
none of them address the memory for words. And um, that's something that only in the last uh, 35, 40 years since ARI first developed it and it became established that we even knew about. And all of those preceded, um, all of those preceded that finding, by the way. Uh, even the most recent of those, which is the, the, the what they called whole language for many years, now they call balanced literacy, but the idea of relying heavily on sentences, that sentence method, I got that term from, from its original use, which was in the 1800s. So that was kind of presented to us as, as a new thing, but it really been around a long, long time. New York City, it was mandated in the 1890s and it didn't work as well as the old whole word method, which was the next one up, uh, and they went back to that. So the three queuing system, it's been the dominant approach that we've taught for years. It's the foundation for many of the different approaches that we have. Um, it hasn't changed since the 60s formulation. So the, the, the multiple cues is something that came about mostly in the 60s. But the, the idea of, of relying heavily on paragraphs and sentences goes back to the 1800s. We have no evidence that it closes the gap with weak readers um, and stays closed, by the way. We do have some where kids seem to make some benefits with some of it, but then you come back a year later in the rare cases where they do a follow-up. And what's interesting is the follow-up is so important. We wanna know, it, does it help for the long haul? And we have some research where they went a year out, two years out, even three years out, and, and uh, we saw the results were maintained. Um, and then uh, interestingly, this is the most common control group. <laughs> All right, it, it, so you go into a school and you wanna test one of those other three method, methods, the first three on the list, uh, you use what they're doing in the school and nine times out of 10, they were using that fourth one. So that becomes the control group and whatever you do is gonna beat that control group. So it's been in many, many studies. It's not been just a few isolated studies. The emphasis on strategies is what concerns me because the strategies are ways of trying to figure out a word and bypass what you need to know about that word. In other words, it gets you to not have to use the phonetic decoding to figure out the word and it doesn't allow you to map the word by attending the sounds in the word to the letters. So in a sense, it's a, it's a workaround. It actually, um, and, and for, for skilled readers, they bypass the tools, by the way, because they already know all the words in the passage or almost all the words, they've, and they've stored them. And when they come across an unfamiliar word, they find it to be far more efficient to sound it out. And if context is gonna help, it's gonna be after having sounded it out. So skilled readers abandon all the tools in the toolbox and, uh, and weak readers, they're not good at sounding out words and they're not good at remembering words. So what's left? Guessing, right? So skilled reading is not skilled guessing. We have no evidence that's the case and we have a lot of evidence to the contrary. I mean, think about it. Give, ki give kids skilled readers a list of words with no context and they rattle off those words instantaneously. They have a large existing data bank of familiar words. All right, I'm not gonna go through this uh, in all details, but basically contextual guessing does not work very well. Syntactical grammatical um, studies have been done with grammar subtests and syntactical subtests, I should say, syntactical subtests off speech pathology batteries and reading, virtually no correlation. So one of the three cues of the three cueing approach does not even use, uh, does not even uh, respond to or correlate to the syntactical knowledge. Um, anyway, sounding out a word all the way through is the best. The graphophonic cues is about first sound, or as Ken Goodman has said, um, sample from as few of letters as you can in order to, for, for, for you to get the word, okay? So it's not about, this third one is not about tracking all the way through the word. Um, and because I'm looking at the time here, I'm going to kind of go through a little more quickly. Whoa, what happened here? I don't know. All right, you're getting it all at once, folks. Sorry. Well, I'll start here. Just pretend there's nothing down at the bottom. All right, we'll get there. So here's where my toes got stomped on because I just assumed it was some sort of visual memory process and it turns out it's not. Our intuition, I look at a chair and say chair. I look at the printed word chair and say chair. Visual input, verbal output, seems like the same thing, but our intuition fails us. Um, input and storage aren't the same thing. Those of you old enough to remember those really ancient, ancient things called telephone books, uh, what did you do? You, you input the number visually. Output was gonna be visual, right? Visual motor for the keypad or the dial. And what did you do? You didn't store it visually, you stored it phonologically, either repeating it out loud or repeating it in your head. So input and storage aren't the same thing. Now that's an example of working memory, but the same is true for long-term memory. They're not the same. Input is visual, but storage is orthographic. We remember the letter order, regardless of the look of the word, uppercase, lowercase, it doesn't matter. James Cattell in 1886 introduced the very first timing device that could time down to one one thousandth of a second, a millisecond. And using that, he found that adults 
their reaction time was faster to a printed word than a picture of the actual object. So they would say dog faster if they saw DOG than if they saw a picture of a dog. Who would have guessed? And he spent the rest of his article trying to figure that out. He had no clue, but it was a very stable finding and it's been shown since. Since the 1970s, we've realized that visual memory does not correlate with reading. Children that, are, that are, uh, have poor word reading dyslexia do not have as a group poor visual memories. How, how does visual memory come into play if that's true? Uh, mixed case studies have shown that it's the order of the letters, not the look of the word that makes a difference. I already gave the example of the, of the bear. Here's why this works, by the way, folks. We have a category in our mind for all of the letters of the alphabet. So the letter R can look a lot of different things, just like a chair. You can have a big comfy chair. You can have a little teeny desk chair. And we still call it chair. So we have categorical knowledge of things around us that we label. And so we also can develop a category of R. And here's all the different ways you can represent R. Here's all the different ways you can represent O or E or whatever. And so as long as children have had exposure to a given font or whatever, uh, then it goes into that category. And now they have that letter order that's remembered. I mean, think about all the different personal handwriting we have to read. Okay, now surprise, surprise, what these bullets are at the bottom, right? And you, but you wouldn't guess what they were. So word reading correlates very well with phonological skills. That's contrary to not correlating with uh, visual memory skills. I already mentioned the issue of children who are deaf. Uh, that's a serious, serious problem. If, if word reading was visual, you would not have that serious problem of individuals with deaf. The average reading level of a child graduating high school who's deaf is about a second or third grade reading level. And then the kicker is that neuroimaging studies have shown that when we do tasks, we have not been involved in one of those studies, but when they do, when the researchers do tasks that involve visual memory versus seeing words that they're familiar with, different areas, different activation patterns occur, right? In fact, they're pretty far apart in the brain. So our intuitions fail us. Uh, but even phonics, okay, so, so it's like, okay, do we just do phonics? Well, you have, to, you have to have phonics skills. Even if a child, I said this earlier, even if a child has never been taught phonics, if they're a skilled reader, they learn the phonics in spite of the fact that they weren't taught it. They figured it out through what we call statistical learning. That's for another time. But they figured out the patterns. They figured out the letter sound relationship. So phonics is not a optional part of becoming a skilled reader. It is an absolute necessity. The question then becomes, why do we not teach it, right? Why do we let kids figure it out on their own? The problem is, yes, maybe somewhere in the range of half to two thirds of kids can figure out phonics on their own without being taught. But aren't we? Don't we want to teach all kids, right? So we. So there are a number of kids that won't pick it up on their own. Anyway, if you teach phonics, we still have kids that don't catch up and there's a small percentage of kids who can't even seem to learn phonics. Well, interestingly, studies have shown that when children who can't even seem to benefit from phonics, check out their, check out their phonemic skills and they're usually extremely poor. And when you build the phonemic skills, suddenly the phonics falls into place. In a very famous study with 63rd through fifth graders with average intelligence, we're in the bottom 2% in reading bottom 2% in nonsense word reading as well. So their phonics skills were very weak. Um, they did, they, they, they continue to work on the phonics skills, right? You never set that aside and say, well, we're going to do this phonemic stuff first. No, no, no. It's got to be together. You're always, always doing reading with the kids, always working on that when you do the phonemic stuff as, uh, on top of that, in addition to that. And um, those kids ended up making, on average, about 25 standard score point gains, which is huge in, in their nonsense word reading, their phonics skills. All right, so phonics by itself, the traditional phonics instruction without some additional phonemic awareness is not enough. And it doesn't necessarily get them to fluency because it's not building the site vocabulary. All right, so here's some of the implications for prevention and intervention. These are not gonna be too startling. Uh, this is what they found. If um, the overall improvement, if you have some kids, the studies would have, you know, some kids get classrooms, receive phonemic awareness instruction or phonological awareness instruction, I should say, and some don't, and they're comparing between them. This is what they found. And by the way, if the, the, the results when they did phonics instruction were pretty similar. These studies, interestingly, focused on the phonemic awareness, other studies focused on the phonics. Um, basically an eight standard score point equivalent difference between the two groups. This is whole group, not bad. The only problem is after about a year or two, 
it chopped down to half. So there's only about a four standard score point difference between the two groups. Hmm, why is that? Well, I explained it a couple slides ago. The children eventually develop the phonemic awareness skills on their own without the instruction if they had enough of the um, basic phonological abilities and they were endowed with that, but not the children who struggled. The children who struggled right out of the starting gates at the end of the study were 13 standard score points different. That's way up from eight. In other words, we're comparing at-risk kids with at-risk kids here, not the whole group. You know, with a large number of the kids in the whole group are going to figure it out on their own. And then did the gap narrow when they came back a year or so later? No, the opposite. It widened. So the children who got this in kindergarten and, for, and or first grade, some of the studies were kindergarten, some were first grade, not one of them, <laughs> at least in the group that I'm looking at here. That, there have been a couple like this, but uh, most of them didn't do K and one. Some did, but it's very, very rare. So look at this, look at the difference. Look at a difference we can make in children by just changing what we do K1. And you're only talking several minutes a day, several minutes a day in our, in our curriculum by doing the phonemic awareness as well as teaching the, the code explicitly. Now, every program out there says, oh yeah, we teach the code, we teach phonics, and they check a box. But are they really teaching this, the, the, whatever the skill is and then giving kids a lot of practice with it? It's not enough to say we can check a box. Yeah, I covered that. It's almost like saying, going back to basketball again, saying, you know, I stood right there in front of the team and I showed them how to make a free throw. They should be able to do it now, right? No, they need, they need the opportunity to practice and to train it. So you get most of your bang for your buck, folks. Listen in, administrators. You get most of the bang for your buck by getting K-1 teachers to teaching uh, and, and uh, explicitly and systematically with lots of practice the code and uh, teaching the phonemic skills that they need. Now, you have about a 50% reduction. This is taking the same information from another angle. You have about a 50 or in some studies as high as 75% reduction in the number of struggling students just by this tier one type of thing. Now, I will tell you this, this is unscientific. It's totally anecdotal, but multiple anecdotes. I've presented these types of things um, be before COVID or whatever, in, in where you can get a show of hands um, in, uh, over 30 states and over a hundred times where it was a mixed audience with people from different districts. If you're presenting one district, you don't, you don't ask this question. But the question was, what, how many of you have in your kindergarten formally teach or first grade, kindergarten or first grade and or first grade, teach or train phonemic awareness to have some sort of formal program that that's taught? In a room of a hundred people, five hands will go up. That's it. That means we're not really doing tier one. And, and now what I've noticed, we've seen a change. You get groups like the reading. Do is to say, leave your hands up. If We knew this from the reading panel in 2000, but we still have not implemented it. So when people talk about tier one, it usually means, oh, I don't know if you're still with me here. Um, can you still hear me? Can someone jump in and let me know? I can't see any faces, so I don't know if I can get a thumbs up. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. I, I had a thing that said my internet was unstable, so all right. Um, so what did they do? What did they do to get the 50% reduction? Now, this is going to shock you. Phonological awareness and letter sound knowledge, right? I bet you didn't see that coming. Yeah, so that, that's what we need to do because that's what the code is all about. That's how the code works, right? And you want to always show the connection between the two. That's why I, I've heard multiple times where people are like, oh, we're just going to do the phonological awareness and then do the reading stuff. No, no, no. You, you do both. You, you always teaching reading, always teaching the phon phonological skills till they've mastered those. And then, of course, good teaching methods always are important, right? Now, when it comes to, whoops, uh, I didn't want to put this slide in here in the first place. That gets a little technical for this group. Um, but let me, let me just say this. Hold on a second here because of the time I have. Um, now I, something's in my screen here. There we go. There. Okay. Um, here's what they discovered. When you look at intervention for children, and I, it could be first grade right up through adulthood in some of the studies, but mostly first through about fourth or fifth. This is a term that was used by some researchers back in 1999, uh, phonemic, well, I didn't use the word phonemic uh, proficiency, but they did like phonemic awareness or phonological awareness intervention continuum or whatever. 
this is what they noticed. And this is a pattern that I've noticed. When you use what we call standard scores to determine, standard scores will tell you if kids are catching up or closing the gap with their peers. We're simple. That was a slide I glossed over very quickly. We're simple raw scores aren't going to tell you that because you can be going up and up and up but everybody else is going up and up at a steeper pace. So you can be going up in your raw scores and getting farther behind at the same time. Anyway, so if you look at standard scores, that tells you, are you closing the gap? Are you getting more toward the, the middle of the distribution or not? So here's what um, I've noticed going through these studies that um, some scores range from zero to five. One spiked up to 0. Or excuse me, 5.85, that's one particular study. But all the others tend to be in here when they do the three of the following. If you do, if you do no phonological, <coughs> oral phonological awareness, if you do no oral, no oral phonological awareness, um, you know, you get two are barely gonna notice it with children in the reading. Uh, many of them did phonics. So they did phonics without any extra phonemic awareness. They all did reading practice. So the three groups I'm going to show you, the minimal group, moderate group, and, and high, highly effective group, all did reading practice. With, and connected text here is what researchers mean, real, real reading. They don't mean text connected to the instruction. What they mean is not in a list, OK? Or not flashed on a computer screen one at a time. So connected text means real reading practice. And then the moderate group did better, six to nine standard score points. And what did they do differently? Well, every one of them did systematic phonics and instruction. Now, none of the non-phonic interventions ever made it out of the zero to five category, just so you know, that I've ever seen. Um, and they also did reading practice, but they added oral phonemic awareness, but only to what I would consider be an ending first grade level. Blending so they could sound out words and segmentation, your real basic stuff. However, the most highly successful group that got very strong standard scores, most of them were in the range of 14 to 17, they... Uh, went after those phonemic skills and developed. Now, I, I don't like the term advanced there. People got confused with that, actually. Phonemic proficiency is the better term. I use the word advanced to mean the phonemic skills that grow after first grade and level out around third. That's what advanced means. People think advanced means uh, phony manipulation, and I never intended that. And I even went through the book and did a, did a search, and I never said that per se, but people inferred that uh, by accident. And I understand. I wasn't clear enough. But the point is, they trained to the level of proficiency. They did phonemic um, uh, manipulation, but many of them, not all, but many of them talked about how they got to the point where the kids were automatic. My own experience with 20 years with this, my mentor's experience 20 years before me, and another uh, person named Dr. Stephen Trush in Canada in three different clinics for the last 30 years, um, he's found the same thing. When you do this, eventually the kids become automatic. We almost never find a child even with the phonological cord deficit who don't become automatic. So I'm, I'm, I'm doing a little bit of a stretch here. I'm inferring that these kids develop the phonemic proficiency by doing those uh, phoneme manipulation activities, which is not guaranteed with the phoneme segmentation activity. And they all did explicit phonics instruction and they all provided reading practice. Now it's, uh, these, are, these findings are consistent with what we know about orthographic mapping as you saw earlier. When they developed the phoneme level skills to a higher level, they had they were better at remembering words. Their scores were much higher. All those scores, by the way, reflect one type of task, and that is a word level reading task. Um, uh, and, and, and there were other tests that they often gave, but it varied from study to study. But the common denominator that I used for those numbers all were um, primarily the uh, word identification test from a major test battery. 50% of the time, it was the Woodcock Reading Mastery Test. Uh, but other times, it could be Woodcock Johnson. It could be the Kaufman or whatever. Um, so the conclusions are consistent with orthographic mapping. Um, when they dealt with the phonemic proficiency, uh, they started to, to catch up. And if you don't develop that, I'm suggesting, based on what we I just showed you, we don't have good reason to think that they're going to catch up. Um, all right, so as a summary, because I'm running out of time here, word level reading is primarily phonological in nature because of the alphabetic nature of our writing system. And visual and memory is not a major component. And skilled readers are all good at phonetic decoding and they're good at remembering words. And the memory for words seems to be based on letter sound proficiency and phonemic proficiency. And fluency seems to be largely, not totally, but largely the function of how many words you know before you read a passage. And reading problems are very preventable. 
And the most highly effective outcomes are when we aggressively go after and fix the component skills, uh, not bypass or set aside some of them or, or neglect them. And so recommendations are develop the skills to promote word level reading that I've been talking about the whole time. And uh, these can de be developed for the most part in tier one, but not necessarily. They, you may need to um, have to do some remedial work. And uh, in tiers two, three, four, I have the and four there because you know I know some schools two and three are general ed and tier four is special ed. Uh, you know two and three are different intensities of of the uh, intervention. So I just wanted to be more inclusive. Uh, as far as that goes. And I think we need to avoid instructional techniques that bypass the skills kids try to learn. Because in a sense, what we might be doing, well, in a sense, what we might be doing is accidentally teaching children to compensate in ways that are not very useful by getting them to guess rather than to head on, be able to sound out the word and then store it. Okay. All right. So I, I, I don't know if you want to have a question and answer time. I, I have no you know, need to dash out of here. Uh, I know some other people probably want to, but I'm happy to, if you happen to have any questions or, um, you know, kind of take it from there. Doc, what we could do is we could have folks push the uh, raise your hand icon on the bottom of the screen if we have any additional questions and then we'll take it from there. So folks, if you want to or have any further questions for Dr. Kilpatrick, uh, simply push the raise your hand button on the bottom of the screen and, um, He'll be happy to stick around for questions. I won't be able to see that if you can. Uh, we don't have one. I, I can see it, Dr. Kilpatrick. Right now, if someone we don't alert me to it. Yeah. Does anyone have any questions for Dr. Kilpatrick? Um, I do. Um, where can we find the training for the skills to develop the techniques that you have very significantly proved we need to be teaching our kids, particularly our poor readers? I, I think more and more of those are emerging. I think there are a, a variety of programs out there. Uh, when it comes to the K-1 level, for the prevention, there's a there's a whole bunch of them. I, I mean, on my shelf behind me on the bottom, I've got a few there and they're pretty inexpensive. I mean, you know, something like Road to the Code with Benita Blackman or Penny McAwareness Young Children, you're talking anywhere from 25 to $70, one-time purchase, go through it with the kids and, you know, um, and that K-1 that's gonna help them uh, dramatically, you know, overall as group results. Now, again, you're going to have maybe 50% of kids that are going to need more than that. 50% of at-risk kids, this is, okay? Lots of kids, of course, are, are well, don't even need it per se, but it will speed up their reading as well. It'll speed up their, their acquisition if they get that in K-1. <laughs> um, and um, for those that it's not enough for them, then you call them aside for your tier two type of work. And, and those can be used for either tier one or two tier, tier two. The ladder to literacy is another. Um, and then you have others, but, but what they don't do much of, if at all, are the manipulation type things, which, which it really, if we want to push past a first grade level of phonemic skills, we're going to have to do that. And I only know off the top of my head of five programs that do that. One is free. It worked for years. It became public domain in 1983, and that's by Jerome Rosner. It was one of the first two programs. What I can do, and I'd be happy to do this for uh, either the superintendents or, um, uh, you know, for Sandy. The, the problem is it can't fit in an email. It's just too huge. But uh, the entire book has been scanned. So it's free to share because right in the copyright page, in the old days, if you got a government grant for something, you could only make money off it for 10 years. They don't do that anymore. You can make money off it forever. Uh, but uh, so it, from 1983, it's been public domain. I, I took a copy, completely scanned it in and people can use it. It worked good then, it can work good now. Uh, if your district has some decent printing, maybe a little spiral binding on it or something would be great. And that's the old Rosner program. So that's one you have uh, equip for reading success, which is kind of a takeoff on that, where you add some airy stuff. You have the, the Haggerty materials, you have phonographics, and you have lips. Those are the those are the five that I know of. I gotta believe there's more out there. Um, there are um, 
There are so many programs. People, a week does not go by that I don't get a question from more than one person saying, tell me about this reading program. What do you think? I'm like, I never heard of it, right? Stuff is coming out all the time. So I think there are a lot of options, but I think it's important to realize that some of them are only going to take you to an ending first grade level. And that's fine. That's fine. Those study, you know, those ones that I mentioned, phonemic awareness in young children, uh, I think the first author is either MJ Adams or Barbara Foreman. And, um, and then uh, Road to the Code by Benita Blackman, Ladders to Literacy, um, I'm blocking on her name for some reason. Um, all, of, all three of those were included in the reading panel when they, when they did a review. So, so there, there are a lot of options out there. The key is to know what are the skills that kids need to do. And then it's a matter of, uh, you know, finding some resources for that. And as far as the phonic end, the letter sound end, those are all more, more or less phon phonological stuff. But um, there, I think there are a lot of good phonic programs out there. I believe there was additional questions submitted through the chat. So uh, Lisa Kitchen, is there more? Yes, um, there's a question. Are you familiar with foundations and it is, a, is it a good program? Well, I, I was on their website several years ago looking it over and it seems to me to be a good uh, phonic program. But I don't think unless they've made some major changes to it that they had sufficient phonemic awareness. So you'd, you'd wanna supplement it. But I think Foundations is probably uh, in that category, I'd say, of one of the many good, good phonic programs. But phonic programs generally don't teach the phonemic awareness. So you may end up with those kids in that, you remember that thing I showed you, they'd be in that bottom, bottom right quadrant where they might become good at sounding out words, but they're still not fluent, they're not good at remembering words. So you, you, those type of programs definitely need supplementation. Okay. Um, Unless they've changed it. If they come out with a new edition and they've got some great Fanny Magorna stuff, then, then my opinion would change, yeah. Okay, we have another question. We use Hegarty in K1 and Foundations K2. We lack connected text. Do you have a recommendation for a good purchase of decodable readers to add? I, I, I don't only because I don't have enough knowledge of that. Mo most of my knowledge comes from reading research articles. And if they ever happen to include, here's a little secret you might say, you hear a lot of people talking about science of reading and that kind of thing. I think people develop this idea with all those, the, the huge volume of studies that I told you about that we have some kind of consumer reports digest of information where researchers are out studying this program and that program. Researchers almost never study a program. They studied concepts. Now, if a program was used in a study, it wasn't to study that program. That program saved them from developing another, you know, let, let's say if you want to compare a phonic approach versus say a three cueing approach. Researchers could have to, would have to write a grant and spend years developing a phonic program, developing a three cueing approach. And there are some of those out there, by the way. There are programs out there that, are, that were researcher designed and never made it to any kind of market. And they're sitting in a file cabinet at, at some university somewhere, which is quite unfortunate. But um, what I'm getting at is if a, if a program is studied, it's not to study that program. That program is considered to be an off the shelf example of a certain teaching philosophy or, or reading philosophy or something like that. So, uh, what you get in a research article is a little one or two, three line description. That's it. So I, I have very limited information about the, the uh, literally there's, there's close to 200 programs, uh, beginning reading programs out on the market. And I, I only know little bits and pieces of, of some of them. Okay, thank you. Um, how about programs for older students, seventh grade or higher? Well, likewise, I don't know much about them specifically, but the key is make sure there's a good evaluation done with those students. I recommend the past, it's free. Uh, it's the kind of thing you have to read the instructions, practice it, uh, you know, make sure that it's done, it's not normed. But it is standardized, meaning every child is supposed to get it pretty much the same way. Otherwise, you don't know, you know, what are you getting if you don't do it right? But uh, practice it, uh, read, read the instructions, et cetera. 
what you're likely to find with most of those older kids, and I'm going to be wrong 5% of the time here, uh, maybe 10 at the most, but I'd say it's five or, or less. You give them the past and you're going to find that they're going to struggle on a lot of those. And why that's significant is because typically developing readers ace that past test by third grade. So it's, it's, it, that's when the skill develops. When I use the past in a number of studies, I can't tell the third graders from the fifth graders, the fifth graders from college students. But boy, I can tell the third graders from the second graders and the second from the first and the first from the kindergarten. So there's a steep increase in that skill that levels out around third. Now, another big study with 1400 students did it differently. They, they, they did deletion, they did timing, but they did it differently. And I don't wanna get sidetracked on the differences but the same basic idea. And they seem to think that the skill leveled out around fourth grade. So, um, so anyway, the phonemic skills continue to grow and develop after first grade. And we have lots of reason to believe that that additional skill development is very important for reading. And for the most part, we don't pay attention to it, right? I mean, Dibbles, Ames Web, Easy CBM, they pull off the phonemic task after first grade. Now, I don't blame them because the correlation with reading on that task drops off after first grade. <clears throat> so it's completely understandable. Uh, but if you use a more sensitive task, like I said, on the, on the, on the new Wechsler, uh, the correlation is like 0.5 or 0.6 on all the word reading tests all the way up through 12th grade. Doc, before the next question, I just want to let the folks that are still remaining on here understand there was a misalignment of the literature that was sent out prior to, so we're gonna send that out first thing in the morning. Okay, there were some folks that did not receive this this evening, so they were not quite sure as to, you know, how they were supposed to receive it. So we're gonna send this out first thing tomorrow morning. Okay. Nathan, and make sure people check their spam mail. That's what was happening to a lot of the links. So we'll resend tomorrow. Thank you. Okay, uh, we have another question. Any recommendations for programs or specific strategies for sixth grade learning support struggling readers? Yeah, what, once again, I, I don't know enough about programs to make specific recommendations. And, and it's, it's more a matter of saying, like think of the things I talked about earlier. We wanna see to it that these children are very proficient in their letter sound skills and very proficient in their phonemic skills. Um, and as far as programs for that level, uh, I, I wish I could tell you and I wish I could recommend them. So I think what would have to happen is to grab, up, as I said earlier, it's a skill that has to be developed. And with older readers, and you give them like the pass test, they're going to do uh, nine, 19 times out of 20, they're gonna do poorly on that. And they're in sixth grade, seventh grade or eighth grade. Um, and so that means they need work in that area. And if they, if they don't develop those skills, we don't have good reason to believe that they're gonna to start to take off in reading because they're not good at remembering words. But when they have that, um, I mean, I, I've been corresponding with a, a gentleman uh, who's 25 years old and he left high school with a first grade reading level, perfectly normal intelligence, severe, severe reading problem. And he's been, he, <laughs> I'm sending him materials and different things to develop those skills. And he was getting friends of his to do it to, to him, right? He, I get emails from him. He's like, this whole world has opened up to him. He could not remember words at all. Just, when I talked to him first a year ago, he's like, what do you mean? You look at a word and it jumps out at you automatically without thinking about it. He didn't even have that experience, right? But he had gotten some intensive phonic training as an adult and it wasn't taking hold because he didn't have the phonological skills for that. So what I'm getting at is there is no there is no point after which a person with poor phonemic skills should cut anchor and not work on that. It, it, going back to my example of, of, you know, I don't care if you're, you're six foot 11 and you can make your free throws. If you can't dribble, you don't belong on the court because every time you get the ball, it's going to get stolen and go to the other team. It just doesn't work. And the same way, if you don't have the skills to remember words, reading is always going to be a struggle and we don't have good reason to think you're going to get a whole lot better you might still get better. You can inch your way. Uh, weak readers do map words. Weak readers do that orthographic mapping, but not in one to four exposures. 
we don't actually know how many exposures and it probably varies from word to word and student to student. But a couple studies that were related to this, um, they stopped after like 18 exposures and they still weren't getting it. So how, you know, so people, I know that because if you see the test of word reading efficiency, which are real words, they go down that first column are all first grade, second grade words. And I've given it to high schoolers who are very weak readers. And they go down that first column and they get every single one right. And all many of those words look just like another word and it's off by one letter and they're not making a mistake. So those words are in their long-term memory, but their, their, their sight word vocabulary grows so slow that they're always gonna be behind. So no matter what the age is, we have to fix the dribbling or the passing or the shooting. We have to fix the phonemic skills they need for reading. We have to fix the letter sound skills to the point where they're automatic. And I, again, I apologize, I can't give you program recommendations. I just simply don't know enough about the specific programs. But I think one of the goals that I have, and it's certainly one of the main goals of the Reading League is to enhance the, the knowledge of teachers as consumers in terms of purchasing or recommending different types of programs. Do they have these? And of course, the buyer beware is every program on the market is gonna call itself research-based. Take that as a standard phenomenon. Uh, nobody's gonna suggest that their program isn't research-based. It doesn't matter. Research-based is not a protected term. Anybody can use it. Any of you can start a program tomorrow, call it research-based, even if it's not. So research-based means one thing alone. When you hear that on a, associated with a program when they're, the, uh, when they're promoting it, it means please buy our program. It has no other meaning than that. You would have to determine if it's research-based by looking at what they're actually doing. So a lot of a lot of the questions coming in are program based, and and unfortunately, it, as as Dr. Kilpatrick has said numerous times, that's not something that can be specifically addressed. Um, we do really want to thank Dr. Kilpatrick tonight for all of this information, and I, and I need to tell you this is not my first time that I've heard him speak, and I still end up with pages of notes when I'm sitting here. Um, because I, I write down something new or I connect it to some other piece of knowledge or a pro project that's taking place in the district. Um, you, you can never hear him speak enough and not walk away with new language. Um, it really was an honor for him to be part of this and, and we thank all of you for your participation in this program tonight. Uh, Mr. Barrett, I don't know if you have anything to say in closing. I agree 100%. I know that my staff was on here. We had a, a large team that we were super excited for him to be here. And we thank you very much. Oh, thanks. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it.